This is the Wally and Mathot Show. Now here are your hosts, Brent Wallace and Mark Mathot. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the show. I'm Brent Wallace, and he's 13-year NHL veteran Mark Mathot, who doesn't trust old people. <laughs> can, you, can you even say that? I don't know if that's allowed, but we have listen, it on. Wanna, we have it on video. I want to clear the record here. Make get the record straight. I I, I like old people. I want to hug every single old person I meet in public. Fair enough. Although I <laughs> I don't think you can do that during a pandemic. No, you can't. I had to think about that for a second. <laughs> anyway, move it along here. <laughs> All right, uh, big show today. It is show number ten, and so for that we wanted to make it a big deal. At least it's a bit of a milestone for us or at least for me, because I wanted us to dress up and you to wear a suit and tie. That clearly hasn't happened as you're in one of your patented t-shirts. But (laughs) instead, I decided we'd dress up the guest list, and that is bring in 15-year NHL veteran Chris Neal. He is the past of the Ottawa Senators. And then we brought in the future of the Ottawa Senators. For the first time ever on the Wally Mathod Show, we have three guests. So Also, in addition to Chris Neal, we have Shane Pinto and Jacob Bernard Docker, who both have signed their new entry-level contracts. While they have yet to play a shift in the National Hockey League, they are about to. They're going to make their Sens debut in the not-too-distant future. Right now, they're quarantining. We got a chance to catch up with them and see how things are going and how their little travel day went as they tried to make their way from North Dakota to Ottawa. All that and more. We've got Craig stopping by with Trivial Trivia. But first, as always, Matt, Let's get to the headlines. But we wanted to do it a bit different, this one, since it's show number 10 and that we've got a heavy sense presence. We wanted to ask you a couple of different questions. And so for that, I decided I'd give you a little bit of homework. And here we go with the headlines. Number one, man of the people. I want to know who your top three most interesting sends of all time that you played with. Uh, You don't appreciate me in a number two, the top three most underappreciated Senator players. What are the prospects? Now, this is the top three prospects in the organization who have yet to play in the NHL. That's key. Up in the rafters. All right, this is a bit of a stretch. Which current senator will have his number retired by the Ottawa Senators? And finally, top show moment so far. Okay, Matt, here we go. Man of the people, give me the three most interesting guys that you have played with. Well, I I like to judge interesting sometimes as perhaps a little weird or just kind of out of the norm as far as hockey players go. And usually a good way to kind of set the bar on that is, is are you able to sit and have dinner with that guy? I'm not going to do that right now because I don't want to bury anybody in particular, but as far as interesting goes, Craig Anderson right away off the top of my head pops up. Um, He fits your typical goalie mold, except he is approachable and you can have a conversation with him. And you know, the guy's a, a car enthusiast. He's got Corvettes. He picked me up as a, in his Ferrari when we were in Florida and took me for a drive, which to me was really fun. Uh, he builds computers. He's got a car simulator in his basement, a racing simulator that he that he's built on his own. So to me, that's something you don't typically see in a player, needless to say. Uh, for, as, for number two, I'll go with Dion Phaneuf, who is a very close friend of mine. And I'm only picking him because he and I had a weird way of kind of connecting. He was my first NHL fight. Then I got to meet him at the world championships overseas and we connected right away. got along very well. Uh, and, and um, for the rest was history between he and I, we, we managed to go on plenty of dinners together and um, just got along really great when he came to Ottawa as well. He was a guy that I hated prior. Then he came into town, got along really well with him. He's an extreme competitor. He brings guys into battle with him. So um, he would be my number two only because of that. And he's very elusive when it comes to media stuff. You don't always see the real Dion. Uh, and number three, I'll go with Zenon Kanapka. I never played with him in Ottawa, but he's a former 67 here, former Ottawa Senator. And I played with him in Syracuse and he was my captain there. And I got a good Zenon Kanapka story. When we were hurting to get in the playoff, we had to go on like a 20 game win streak or at least get points in 20 straight games toward the end of the year. So Zenon, for all the theatrics that he brought, this is one of them. He suggested that we'd grab a hammer and chisel and each player who was appointed player of the game afterwards had to chisel in the game number, right? So if it was 20 of, you know, all the way down to zero. Naturally, our uh, team trainer slash equipment manager, poor guy's name was Rodney, did not like this idea. And Kanopka didn't care. He just kept doing it. Every game we'd get a win, he'd go up to the wall, give it to a player, and we were forced uh, to chisel in that game number into the wall in the dressing room. 
So eventually Rodney came up and confronted Zen and Kanaka and Z, I believe, grabbed him by the neck and kind of pinned him up against the wall and gave him an earful and basically told him, listen, this is happening whether you like it or not. And lo and behold, we made the playoff that year. So that was one small sample size story of Zen and Kanaka. Moving forward with you, Wally, I'm sure we'll get into more. That's so interesting. So what if you were on the road, though? Were you chiseled into the dressing room on the road? No. We wouldn't do it. in the, So we would wait till we came back home and do it at home. That's a good question. But yeah, so by the end of the year, you had all these, these numbers chiseled into the locker room. And it's in the American League, right? So cash is a little tighter down there. <laughs> Coaches, the, the owners weren't enthused about it either, but it worked. We had a very crazy team at the time. We had about five fighters. So it was allowed and we got away with it. I'm so intrigued by this. All right, we will get yeah. Zen and Kanopka on and we'll listen more about this story. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I made mine a lot easier than yours, but I've now I realize I have two goalies. One, Dominic Hasek by far was the most interesting man that I've ever dealt oh God, with. Yeah. Uh, I think playing in the NHL in general, just he was just a different duck altogether, but he was very entertaining, <laughs> a very outgo. I actually quite enjoyed uh, speaking with him. One, I don't know if I ever told you the uh, when I got a goalie stick signed by him. So, one of these back here is signed by Dominic Hasek, and I and I knew he's at the end of his career, and I just said, "Hey, Dom, like, I, I'm not supposed to ask, but if you have a stick, I'd like to like to have one for my collection because you and I had spent so much time together." And so, he is playing for Detroit at the time. He's so it's at the end of the game, and in Ottawa, the two dressing rooms were, as you know, Matt, in the same tunnel, in the same hallway, yep. but they're they're spread apart. He's yelling at me from the from the Detroit side down to the Ottawa side. Hey. Hey, and he's waving this stick. Now you're not supposed to, you can lose your press pass. And so I'm like, Oh yeah. my God, what is he doing? So I'm now, <laughs> I'm now going down this thing. I got your stick. And I'm like, ah, Dom, uh, can you just put it aside? Anyway. So I, I tried to hide it and get it out of there, but that was, yeah, I'll never forget that. And I also, <laughs> we went to, uh, we'd always get uh, players to do it was the night before Christmas. They'd read a line, whatever. And and so I went to Detroit and when he was just about to face Ottawa and I said, Dom, like, would you mind doing a line? And he was like, I don't know anything about Twas the Night Before Christmas, but I know Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. And he starts singing Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. It's, it's one of my favorite moments of all time. So I, I can just I always, picture him singing it. That's yeah, awesome. with that great Czech accent. Anyway, it's very good. All right, I'll, I'll move yeah. on quickly. Yarko Rutu was also another character in the locker room. Um, very interesting guy. And I always enjoyed lots of laughs with him being around. And number three, uh, Ray Emery was... Uh, certainly one of the characters of all time. He, he just had a swagger about him and everything he did was just a little bit different than everybody else, including, you know, driving the orange Lamborghini to the, to the games and all that stuff. And so I, I always appreciated Ray. He was always very good to Ian Mendez and I, he just didn't like the local media as much. So uh, those are my top three. All right, moving on. Number two, you don't appreciate me. Give me your top three most underappreciated senators that you played with. Okay, well, the first one isn't necessarily a guy that I played with a lot, but I'd like to pick a current player on the team right now. So I went with Nick Paul for my number one right now, only because I just love the way he plays. I love the path that it's taken him to get here. He's been incredibly resilient and relentless in making this team full time, hasn't given up. And he's always at the top of the leaderboard in fitness testing, which to me is a, a testament to his work ethic in the summertime. So I can relate to that. I, I love that about him. I love his potential of being a good centerman on that team. He skates really well for his size. He's doing all the right things. So right now, you know, he's not putting up a ton of points. He's not really ever in discussion when you're talking about the young core, so to speak, but he's right in there, in my opinion, in effectiveness. And those are the types of guys that you need uh, to make noise in the postseason. So for me, Nick Paul would be number one. Number two, from a fan's perspective, I guess you could call it, because growing up here in Ottawa, I was obviously watching all the Sens games. I know he's a goalie. They're not typically underrated, so to speak, but Patrick Laleem for me, um, just because, wow. yeah, I know it's weird. It's a weird one. He's uh, second all I'm, time and wins. First I and know, shutouts. I know, but, but just for me again, second in all time, I, I, I just, I was always a fan of his growing up. I wanted to kind of try to get him incorporated in this just because he was right around that time when I was really watching the sense a lot as I was getting into my teens. So I'm going to put him in there. Number two and number three, Another guy that I played with is Kyle Turris. Uh, you know, the guy just put his body on the line all the time. He was clutch. He was always playing through injuries. When I have pictures of Kyle Turris in my head, what fans don't know, is just seeing him in the trainer's locker room on the table with the medical staff 
and he was getting injections either in his wrist or his fingers or his hands or his shoulder. And he was playing through a ton of injuries. I've got so much respect for that guy. He always, always positive. He was never grumpy like I was at times. He always had a smile on his face. He always looked very tired. <laughs> so for me, he's the kind of guy that, you know, you'd love to have on your team. Certainly when he was playing back then with us, he was such a fantastic player. So Kyle Turris at number three. Interesting. Okay. And I have asked you now two questions of players you've played with and both times you've gone off the board. So uh, thanks for paying a lot, <laughs> paying attention to the rules of the game. All right. Uh, I will say my uh, first uh, underappreciated player is Alex Burroughs. Of course, he's my favorite Senator of all time. I'm just kidding. I'll move. I was going to say you're picking Burr, eh? Okay. But I, <laughs> see, see, we've created this weird dark cloud over my relationship with Burr just because yeah. of the, the interview we had with BX. Yeah. You know, I got along great with him. I want to, you know, let the that, record that's, show that's, that, that I do like him as a guy. He's a good dude. We, we can back up the tape, but what you did say <laughs> you claimed that he stole your watch, but anyway, and, uh, and snores and snores. <laughs> I, I, I'm not, you know, okay, like we'll on move on. Wait, I, I'm going to try to get him on the show as well, but right now he's a little okay. busy with the Munchal Fair fans. Enough. Okay. Fair uh, top three most underappreciated senators. So we can move on. Zach Smith by far Magnus Arvidsson, the machine. Yeah. Uh, he yeah. was known as a guy that was always injured and played through so much. He lost two inches of his bow after hitting the gate uh, door open in Philadelphia one time. Oh. And so that guy played through everything. And number three, Curtis Lecision. Only 55 players for the Ottawa Senators skaters, 57 total two goalies, have played 200 or more games with this franchise. Uh, he has played 200 games. He doesn't get a lot of recognition, but what he did was help anchor that blue line when he came over for Colorado and kind of showed a winning ways, and he was an, uh, just a, a great leader for them back there. So he really brought a, a veteran presence. So Curtis Decision is my third guy. All right, uh, moving on to what are the prospects? Who are your top three prospects not currently playing in the National Hockey League? Well, the okay, the no-brainer picks, I think, right now, just based off all the noise and the small sample size clips that I've been watching and their pedigree, you know, you got the JBD, Shane Pinto, Jake Sanderson. I think those are the no-brainers, the obvious answers. So I'm going to go off the board here and go with Igor Sokolov, only because I, from what I understand, his skating is through the roof, yeah. Way better from before. He's made he's made vast improvements there. He's on a scoring tear right now down in Belleville. He's playing fantastic hockey. He's a big man. I hear he's a character off the ice, a really good dude who's bought in and is dedicated now to making that jump. So, you know, we can go through all these prospects and pretend like we're watching all of them all year round. I've seen some, some small sample size clips of what Sokolov can bring and how much his skating's improved. And he's a six foot three, 225 pound centerman. I mean, I love that. I, this this team right now up here needs that. So I'm rooting for him. I'm a fan. And maybe I should have just said, who's your most intriguing prospect? Because he's the same for me as well. And yeah. a little research I've done, because I, I don't have a lot of time to spend on the show, as you can tell, is that <laughs> Igor Sokolov and you are tied together. And I don't know if you know that this or not. That is correct. No, no, that so, is correct. Yeah. June 27th, uh, June 26, 2017, his draft rights are traded from Dallas uh, to Vegas for Mark Mathot along with Dylan Ferguson. So Ferguson and these rights, which ended up being Sokoloff for Mark Mathot. I don't know if you knew that or not. Go and then bigger. he's also involved in the Mark Stone deal uh, as his draft rights were traded from Vegas with Brandstrom and Oscar Lindbergh to Ottawa for Tobias Lind Lind Lindbergh, excuse me, and Mark Stone. I didn't Stone. know that one. I didn't so know that one. So interesting. So he's got a great history of trades, if you will, of being involved in these two big deals. Uh, He's like, as you said, there's a great story about him. There's lots of stuff written about him, the athletic. And I think Haley Salvian has done a great job yeah. of talking about him, but he's done a lot of work. He is by far, he might be one of our most interesting senators of all time, by the way that he continues to play. So he's a guy Agreed. that I want to keep an eye on for sure. All right. Here's the interesting one that I thought was entertaining. And that is which <laughs> current Ottawa Senator is going to have his number retired and hang up there with Alfredson Phillips, Likely Chris Neal. Is it going to be? And I'll give you an option. Brady Kachuk, Thomas Shabbat, or Tim Stutzla? Uh, and <laughs> when you sent me the list of potential questions here, I cringed at that one only because <laughs> I, we're talking about kids right now, right? And yeah, absolutely. And, and, and to make, and you know, it's, and it's fun. And to make the projections is always interesting. And uh, so I'll, I'll say this based off of what I'm seeing right now and fan 
you know, fan reaction to the, the on ice play that we're getting from those three gentlemen. I'm going to go with Brady. I, I, I'm usually partial to the defenseman. I'm a huge fan of Thomas Shabbat. But for me, Brady Kachuk right now might potentially be that guy. And, and I'm saying this only from what I'm seeing on the ice with his production, with the way he plays, with the, you know, the heart and soul style hockey brand that he brings. And, and, and potentially putting up 25 to 30 goals a year here moving forward. And if he's here for a nice long period of time, hopefully, then you, we can start having those discussions. And as we all know, to get up there, you got to win games too. You got to be on winning teams. So uh, I'll stay with Brady right now. I'm reluctant down the road to look at this tape and see what happens, but we'll see. Uh, it's on the, no one's going to pay attention to this. Uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I mean, here's the key, and you brought it up as long as they're still here. So I don't know exactly if Brady Kachuk is going to be here for his entire career. So I think why is that? Well, he's got a contract coming up. What, no, what I happens? know, but you don't think, Hey, you don't Wayne think Gretzky sign? got traded. So I don't <laughs> That's know. True. Like, he can you still sign. Up, you can't yeah. bring up a Wayne Gretzky comparison. That's unfair, but I get it. Point taken. <laughs> but if everybody's right. Like who would have thought yeah, that? Every, I don't know. Everyone's Mark Stone or Eric Carlson, whatever. So yep. I, he might sign a deal. Maybe it's just a two-year deal, but my, I think that Thomas Shabbat, who's already signed to that eight-year contract, has the yeah. best chance because he is signed. And there's no question he's the best defenseman on this team right now. So I'm going to go no Thomas Shabbat of everybody will have his number retired because I think he'll be here the longest. That'll really That's set fair. people up. That's yeah. fair. Yeah, I, I have no argument to that. I mean, it, it comes down to term, right? And I think a lot of now, Sense fans will be a lot more comfortable if we can give Brady Kachuk some term. Don't uh, don't send me any hate mail. All right, and last headline, that is, what is your top show moment so far through the first nine episodes, Beth? Oh, uh, this is hard because I don't want to pick anybody in particular and show that I'm showing a little favoritism here. But I think for me, the no brainer would be an Eric Carlson's interview when we alluded or discussed the uh, the bear <laughs> evasion tactics, and he was talking about zigzagging, which we all know is ridiculous because. They're way faster than we are. But yeah, that to me, that was probably my favorite moment just because of how ridiculous it was. It is so good. I don't know if I've laughed that hard during an interview, but I will say I, I'm going to go with my favorite moment was the moment where you confirmed that Daniel Alfredson was going to be our first guest on the show. So I thought that that set the whole tone of how things were going to play it. We've had fantastic guests through the first 10 shows. we got more surprises coming up. And so I just thought that setting the tone Bringing on Alfie, who's the greatest senator of all time, was huge. And it was a simple text that you told us about. So that one will always stick out with me. So uh, we have had fantastic guests. Our show's gotten off extremely well so far. We appreciate all the viewer feedback. And so we're looking for more. Uh, but first, we've got lots more to do in this show. We call it the extended version, our special top 10 show, if you will. And that is coming up after the break. We go one on one. With Chris Neal, who played 15 years for the Sens, played every shift like it was his last and left it all out there. And he's got lots of little things to discuss and some nuggets to give you. So don't go anywhere. That's coming up after the break. You're watching The Wally Mathot Show. Welcome back to the show. Pleased to be joined now by the guy who said, quote, just a small town kid with big league dreams. And that actually happened for 16 years in the National Hockey League. Chris Neal, welcome to the show, my friend. Thanks for having me on, Wally. Uh, I'm glad to see you and uh, Meth have been reacquainted because you were longtime friends in the locker room. Let's just get right into this, shall we? What were you like in the locker room? Because Meth has said a lot of things over the past couple of shows about how you are uh, uh, different in the room. I, I like to have fun, keep it loose. Um, obviously, that's half the battle. But uh, whenever you're with uh, everyone for such a long period through the, the course of a season, you want to keep it loose in there. And whether you have your ups or downs through the season with uh, wins or losses, but uh, I find if you you keep a good uh, good room, good atmosphere, and you'll have fun with it, uh, you know, it's all like a it's a big band of brothers in there. And you know, that's, uh, you're able to joke and have fun. And, you know, sometimes you argue with them, sometimes you fight with them, but you know, that's what it's about. Uh, Meth, can you really just give us the dirt then? Cause that was too easy an answer. <laughs> well, there's not, there's nothing bad, I guess, cause I'm, I'm terrified <laughs> of Neeler still. So I don't want to, but uh, no, I, Neeler's the kind of guy, like I still remember, you know, if I said something to him on the plane that ticked him off a little, or we were just joking around, 
I still remember the one time getting off the plane. I've said the story before where I come off, I'm going to my car thinking life's going to be fine. I go to the truck. I think it was the truck. And there's a pe peanut butter and jelly sandwich smeared all over my windshield. So Neeler was the kind of guy <laughs> that if you, if you tried to prank, he would get you back in some way, shape or form and normally much worse. And the list goes on. There's some stories and battles with him and Smitty. Neeler, do you remember the Smitty ones where you'd put his clothing in an ice machine during practice? <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, you know, you know, with Neeler, it was always stuff like that. So he'd mess with you. So he was a good prankster around the room and it kept things light. And it was funny. And uh, I mean, I go on and I'm sure we'll go through a lot of that stuff here as we move forward. Well, absolutely. Because you just glossed over this story. So, uh, Neeler, can you tell us the Smitty closing the ice bucket story? Well, Zach, uh, he thought um, I got him, but I actually didn't. Someone else did. So anyway, um, he he did something to me. So I'm like, uh, you know, I may, I want him to own up to it, and he wouldn't. So I'm like, I took all his clothes before practice, and I put it in the uh, the ice machine. Um, to, so when he came off, he had nothing to, you know, cold clothes to put on, and you know, they're soaking wet. So anyway, it was pretty good. You, but uh, you should have seen it. It was like it was like. You know, like something that had like been starched like time at that times a thousand, like it was completely frozen and ruined. Like, I don't even know what he went home in. Like, I can't remember what Smitty wore. It was probably like locker room gets right. Dealer? Yeah, I don't, he did. It was like one that. of the uh, property of senators. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> I, <laughs> now, and he was so mad. Yeah. <laughs> what is it that you uh, he did to you that you didn't want to admit to here? Um. Honestly, like whenever someone gets me, I usually, it's usually not even too bad, but I just kind of, you know, take it to the next level. So, you know, I know with, um, you know, for once, uh, you know, Magnus Arvison uh, came in and my, uh, my fake teeth were uh, painted with permanent marker black. And uh, no. so anyway, um, he had this favorite pair of socks that he wore on game days. So I, I literally took a pair of scissors and I cut his socks all up and left them in his shoes. So. He would, and so then Steve Martin's when uh, Stevie Martin was there, he uh, so he's telling everyone the story, and Arby thought it was him that got his uh, socks, so he cut his one pant leg to make him think he grew. <laughs> <laughs> so how did you find out that Arvidsson did this? Well, uh, I just uh, good re reliable sources, and uh, he actually <laughs> confessed to it after. But uh, you know, there's lots of them. Uh, you know, I think. Uh, uh, I got into uh, Tampa Bay the one night and my room was uh, torpedoed uh, on the road. So the guys uh, did my room up. So I went down to security and uh, I talked to them and, you know, I gave the guy a $20 US to look at the footage and I seen Patrick Weirkoch coming out of my room. So I, oh my I, God, I, him. I forgot and, about uh, that. So I'm like, oh, you're going to get it. And I waited, <laughs> waited, waited. So I, I went to Farm Boy and I bought, bought a piece of salmon and I put it on the manifold <laughs> of the truck. <laughs> so I remember yeah. that. And 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 because Neeler's brutal for this, right? Like he'll like let he'll like it gets a slow burn with Neeler. He'll let it kind of simmer for about a week before he gets you back. So every day you're dealing with anxiety and stress because you never know when someone's gonna throw you under the bus and tell Neeler that you messed with him. <laughs> and with with Patty Weirkoch, Neeler slid salmon under his back seat or whatever it was, and it was in there for like a week, <laughs> right? It was there for a while. It, no, oh, it was man. there for a while. Actually, uh, I got his keys. I was uh, I had a maintenance day, so I, I knew I wasn't going on the ice. They were all out for practice. So I went out and popped the hood of his truck and put it right on his manifold because he could smell the fish smell coming oh, yeah. in. But uh, he's looking under the seats, couldn't find it, but it was right on his motor. So he actually uh, he took his truck in to get looked at from a mechanic. And he's like, yeah, there's a piece of fish. Anyway. <laughs> is, is there a, is there a, is this the best or is there a worst one? Uh, there, there's lots of good ones. Um, <laughs> we have I all day. Pa well, Patrick Aline, we uh, filled his car up right to the, well, we opened up the sunroof and we had the big bags of popcorn. We filled it right to the roof. So he opened up the door, oh, there's man. popcorn everywhere. So, and greasy <laughs> oh, too, no. leather seats. He was sliding all over the place. Did How did he take did that? It? Sorry, go ahead. Oh, uh, he, Patty's awesome. Patty's, uh, you know, he's the, one of the most normal goalies I've ever played with. So, uh, you know, he, he's always fun and, you know, it's, uh, he's one of those guys that, uh, he's light in the room. Uh, he's a goalie. You can actually talk to on a game day. And, you know, that's just, that says a lot about him. He likes to have fun and, you know, horse around, joke around and, 
he, he, I've never seen a guy get uh, under Todd White's skin like Patrick Colleen. <laughs> Want to elaborate? Well, no, he just said, uh, well, Todd White, we call him the, the mole or the rat because he's always wants to know everything that's going on. And uh, <laughs> so Patty would come in and just throw out some absurd comment in, in the trainer's room and Whitey would be like, he's like, oh, we got to run 5K today. Oh, and then he's a worrier too. So, you know, when uh, training camp come around, he'd be the worst one for uh, like anxiety, like with testing, wanting to know everyone's results, like even worse than meth. So, <laughs> You know, I was bad because I was talking to BMO earlier. I'm trying to get dirt on you. And he's like, you know what? Kneeler's worse. It, sorry. He was like roughly on par with you, Matt, for the, the after game sheets. You know, like you and I were both hawks with making sure we both got all the right stats. Like we don't want to miss a minus or a penalty or an assist. Or and he hit. mentioned that. <laughs> or, a, or a hit. Yeah. So like if I'm looking after the game at the game sheet and a guy like Patty Weirkoc had more hits than me, like I knew something was wrong. So yeah. I would go, I'd go to BMO and I'd be bitching to him about it. And he said, he's like, you were pretty bad for that too. And I actually remembered after the fact. Well, <laughs> my, my biggest thing, I always want to see the game sheet to make sure I got over 10 minutes. So I didn't have to ride the bike. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's right. <laughs> I can, I can remember being in the press box in an intermission and they get, we're all up by the NHL staff uh, stats guys. And someone said, Neeler wants the video check because he's pretty sure he got the goal. So I always remember you always wanted the video checked whenever you were close to perhaps picking up a point. But I don't blame you either, by the way. Well, it was one of those things like, uh, you know, for me, you know, you go out, you work hard and, you know, do what you have to do for the team. Uh, I still remember Mike Hoffman was having a contract year and he offered me 500 bucks for a goal. And I said, no. <laughs> <laughs> That's a, no, but I can relate to that. Like guys like us, when I'm not even close to what Neeler was tough wise, but I mean, I never got points. So if you got a goal or an assist, like you wanted to make sure you're rewarded for it. You don't want some other snake on the team taking it from you. So you'd get passionate about it. I was the same way. And, and sometimes our PR guys would be like, Matt, like not around the media, like don't let them hear you. And I'd be like, I don't care. Like go fix it right now. You know, and, and I'd be making a scene in front of all the media guys. Uh, uh, Neela, didn't you get credit for the first goal in the Prudential Center when New Jersey opened their new building, but it was like two days later? You know, it was like two weeks later I had to wait for it. But yeah, it was, you know, I'd like for me, I, you know, I'd go to the net hard and, uh, you know, some goals. Yeah. You have some nice ones, but there's a lot of them that, uh, you know, it's a tip or it goes off your shin pad or whatever, but uh, you're in the right, uh, right place at the right time. And, uh, you know, doing what you, what I'm supposed to do. Like I, you know, I know whenever um, the one year I played a lot of power play at the start of the year, Elfie would just say, Hey, just stand in front of the net. He goes, he goes, I won't hit you. Trust me. So I just stand there with my eyes closed trying to. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I want to s- keep with the locker room stuff for a sec. One is you didn't really like us crowding around your stall very much. We brought this up on previous episodes. Like you would have Alfie was two stalls over, I think, or Pajot was next to you. You've he had others tape. in there. Well, he, not only would he put tape, he'd take a uh, hockey skate lace and lay it out in a oh yeah that's in right. a semicircle so like <laughs> no media could go near him and and so I was if you got too close you'd end up with tape on your pant leg or your shoelace <laughs> untied I don't know if you remember any of that meth or uh, Neeler I had a few of those instances with you yeah I, no obviously uh, like I said uh, it's a it's fun in the room and you know to give the the media you know to keep them you know like lighthearted and you know uh, keep them involved and. I always found I had a good relationship with, uh, with the media and, um, you know, uh, reporters and, you know, able to joke around with them. But, uh, I started that one year in playoffs, um, with the skate laces, making a barrier, um, just around just a, you know, separation. I was preparing for COVID right off the get go. So, um, <laughs> anyway, uh, it's just one of those things. And then, uh, you know, some guys are doing other, uh, interviews beside you or whatever, like Gord Wilson, I used to get him. I'd throw some oh, tape yeah. at him. He'd be trying to do an interview and he'd dodge him and, you know, throw snow at him and stuff or, uh, you know, just reach over your stick and be tapping his leg, the inside of his leg. And so anyway, you just have fun with it. And, you know, those guys remember that. I remember that, you know, it's all the, all the fun stuff and it keeps it loose in the room. And uh, like I said, everyone's there. we got a job to do, but uh, you know, you might still have fun doing it. Yeah. Cause you used to go at me pretty hard about my less than dark colored hair. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and all I could come back with was, you know, put your teeth in today or something, but yeah, uh, it was enjoyable. I, 
the other thing was you had one of the strangest, I'll say, pregame rituals or whatever, or routines, and that's new, sk- new skate laces every time. And how did that even come about? So I, uh, one of the, th- I, every game I'd always put new uh, skate lace in because they're, they're all TV games. You got to look good for the, the TV. So, um, but uh, no, I, one of the things, uh, you know, whenever you're into a, a bunch of altercations, uh, your hands are sore and you know, whenever uh, laces get uh, used a bunch of times or they get wet, dry, wet, dry, they, they get really stiff. So um, there'd be sometimes, um, you know, you go out, you, you had a fight or two the night before and, you know, trying to tie your skates. And I always tie my skates every period too. I take them off and because uh, I like them tight. And anyway, um, you know, so it was just, it was more for uh, my hands because they'd be banged up throughout the year. And then it just became a routine thing. So, um, you know, and I, and I use two pairs of laces. I always like them real tight at the bottom. So I'd, uh, I'd have a knot right at the bottom of my, uh, my skate. And then I would lace them up through just because the, the, the length of the laces that was in between what I liked. So, um, which leads me right into, I'm going to go into fighting if you will, for a sec, cause you were known as the guy that stood up for his teammates for forever. Uh, how are your hands today? Do they suffer, I guess, arthritis? I uh, yeah they, they do like uh, rainy days it's uh you know the arthritis kicks in and stuff but uh you know I my, my left hand I you know I Valentine's Day I was I, I fought Gazdick and I broke my thumb um right before the trade deadline and anyway um you know it was a heck of a fight and we were up 6-1 or something like that and I and uh sort of Brian's God, don't fight don't fight and anyway I go out and I fight and anyway it's uh <laughs> But I got a plate and 10 screws in my thumb. So that uh, gets a little uh, like cold weather. It uh, gets stiff. But uh, when they did my x-ray on my left hand, I had five fractures in my left hand. I never knew I had. And, and I'm a righty. So I just imagine what my right's like. <laughs> wow. Um, who is the one guy you didn't want to fight, but you had to or did? Was it Chara? That, no, not at all. Like I, for me, I just, I always did what I had to do for the team. And, you know, I think uh, when he had a spark, uh, I always uh, go, you know, I think I got so much respect for all those guys and what they do and what they bring. It's uh, the toughest job in hockey because uh, you can't take mm-hmm. a night off. Uh, if you are, you're looking up with the rafters and uh, you know, I, for me, it didn't happen well that often. And anyway, I just show up and be ready to go and, and give them everything they want. But uh with my size, like, you know, I wasn't the biggest guy out there, but, uh, you know, so I could uh, dabble um, with middleweights and, you know, that guys would, would always come up to me in that part. And then, you know, I could always hold my own with the, the heavyweights and, you know, that just kind of made me a unique player and, you know, it helped me play for as long as I did. The kneeler is being modest though, because what people don't know is how hard he worked and how friggin' thick the guy was. Right. So if you tangled with him, I still remember getting to Ottawa. And I think just for fun, after one practice, you showed me a couple of things you obviously wouldn't remember, but just hanging on with him and feeling him grab me and showing me jabs and stuff kind of gave you an idea how strong he was. So he's downplaying it a little bit. The guy was an animal when it came to actually wrestling with players on the ice. <laughs> I, uh, some guys uh, would like to watch fights all the time and before games. And, you know, I wasn't one of those guys because I always found every fight's different. Uh, you know, I, I still remember uh, Sean Thornton. I, I probably had the most fights ever against him uh, in my whole career between the minors and the NHL. But uh, anyway, um, I still remember I, you know, I came out and uh, I was, I switched up. He was a righty and I, went, I ended up going lefts on him and, uh, you know, I could throw both and it made a roll of difference. So anyway, I'm like, oh, next time I come in and, you know, I think I'm like, you know, he's a righty. And then all of a sudden he, he actually took some lessons in the summertime, how to throw lefts. And I said, like, oh, here we go. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, so would you and him be buddies today? Have you ever like had a chat with him? Well, that was my last regular season uh, fight uh, was against Sean Thornton. And uh, I, I actually broke my finger on him. Um, so it was in Florida. And uh, he actually, uh, he jumped Mark Borwicky. And anyway, so I, I literally, in Guy Boucher, the, the donkey, but uh, anyway, he didn't put me out uh, like right away to take care of it. And anyway, so I waited, waited, never played, never played. And and I, I finally got out to take care of it. And uh, so, and they were up too. And, you know, he was, he was awesome about it. And he's like, I go, I go, Thorpe, we got to go. And he's like, I know. He goes, you know, let's take it easy on each other or some of that. But we went at it. And so 
so uh, after the game, you know, I, I go into the training room, my fingers all messed up. It's like went up that much. Like it's still all mangled. And anyway, uh, but uh, we're, we're uh, I'm in Florida's uh, dressing room and they have the x-ray machine in there and he's on one, one of the beds getting x-ray and I'm on the other bed getting x-ray. <laughs> Actually, uh, he got the trainer to go grab us two beers, so I'm having a beer with him after the game. So not, I'll never forget that. He's uh, he's an awesome guy. So that is outstanding. Uh, all right. So uh, when it comes to chats, you guys have your tussles, or even with guys who've gotten offsetting minors. When you go to the box, who is the yappiest guy on the other side? Um. There, there's lots of guys. Normally, uh, the ones that are yapping the most are the ones that uh, are hiding underneath the bench from the the players bench, and uh, you know they'll be chirping you on the way by or whatever. And you know, Matthew, you get that with a big hit or whatever. You guys will chirp you from the bench. It just it drives you crazy, but you just kind of shrug it off, and that was yeah. your next, you know. And anyway, you let them know that way. But uh, no, they're for the most part, guys are pretty respectful, and um, you know, I think uh, there was. Um, back in the uh, the days against the the battle of ontario and uh, you know there were some guys like but tucker used to chirp a lot and you know i think a guy like sean avery was another one uh, you know that just always in everyone's uh, kitchen to a certain degree but uh, you know i think um you know for the most part you're you're professional you're able to tune them out and you know show up and be able to do what you're you're supposed to do all right, I'm going to go. All right, I'm going to get to the Battle of Ontario now since you brought up Darcy Tucker, because I'm going through looking at some old highlights of yours and battles with Battle of Ontario. The one I always keep seeing, or is perhaps my favorite, is you are standing on the bench. Darcy Tucker is on the ice, and the two of you are throwing at each other. Like, you can't imagine that in today's game. Can you take us, I don't know, through the whole Battle of Ontario and what it was like, I guess, with Tucker and Corson and all uh, Ty Domi? So, yeah, it was, you knew uh, when you're going in to, to play Toronto or they're coming in here to play that uh, something was going to happen. It just, it was, it was reality. And, uh, you know, I, I'd almost say like if Toronto was coming in and I'd have my pregame nap and in my nap, I, I'd, I'd, I'd fought tight on me in my nap, you know, so I, I'd fight him twice that night. Um, once in my, and I, in my pregame nap, I'd wake up and my arm would be caught in the bed sheet and I'm trying to throw a punch. So, Anyway, um, you know, so it, like you knew it was going to happen um, and, you know, there was always uh, something. And, uh, you know, I think uh, they had a, a team that uh, had a bunch of guys that uh, were gritty and they had, they had some tough guys as well. So uh, for them to get, uh, they, they ran the Ottawa round on a couple of uh, playoff series. So whenever I finally made the team, uh, you know, exhibition, I, I went right after um, Gary Roberts at the end of one game and I gave him a, a big shiner. And, you know, he said, you know, that, you know, I respect from the kids trying to make the, the NHL and I made it that year. And it's, uh, but, you know, you go back to those uh, games with like uh, Tucker coming out of our bench and stuff. And that's the only time I, uh, I got called to the principal's office uh, from Cole and Campbell, but uh, anyway, um, I was, you talk with guys chirping from the bench. He, he had a hit and I, I said something from the bench and anyway, he just like the switch went off and he just he lined right to our bench. And so anyway, uh, I kind of, I didn't know what he was going to do. I had the water ball right there, ready to squirt him in the face or whatever. And anyway, uh, so anyway, he jumps in our bench. So I'm like, Oh, here we go. So I just stand up. I'm on solid ground and I, I have him. I start throwing punches at him. And so I, Mike Fisher was standing beside me. He goes, I, like I hit him once his eyes kind of went back and he went down and I'm holding him up on, cause I'm on solid ground. So my balance is a, a lot better if not on ice, but, uh, so I, I'm starting to throw still and I'm holding him up from going down and I'm, I'm throwing and all of a sudden my arms, like I can't throw anymore. I'm like, Dang. And, and then, and Jock Martin is holding my arms. So um, <laughs> I'm like, Oh, let me go. Let me go. So then, um, our helmet came off. The, uh, our trainer threw the helmet back over, hit Pat Quinn. And so anyway, uh, Colin Campbell basically said, uh, so we had called in and, um, you know, I'd never been suspended my whole career. So that's something I'm very proud of. But uh, he, uh, he calls me in. He's like, uh, Tucker said, you spit on him. I said, Colin, I go, if I, if I was able to spit on him from the bench to center ice, I go, they should put that in the Olympics and I win gold medal. So, <laughs> anyway, he started laughing and that was the end of it. So I, I got out of it. Then uh, our trainer ended up getting a little more trouble than I did. So anyway, a little short story. 
That's funny because Pat Quinn kept saying for about two or three games later, they spit on our guy. Can you believe that? And later he ended up having to apologize to say, no, there was no one that spit on the, from the bench. So yeah, <laughs> uh, I always remember that particular incident from Pat Quinn, because he was always good at trying to rile that up. Right. And then there's Jacques, who's very stoic on the other side, not saying a whole lot. Do you, did you, did you feed off of like Jacques not saying anything? Well, Jacques didn't really say anything. I just, uh, he'd always put you in a situation where, you know, I, I, I watch the game very closely. If my guys are getting or taking liberties on my teammates, I, I pay attention. I, you know, so anything that ever happened, uh, you know, when Alfie was there, Eric or anyone, you know, I, I took care of it. Um, you know, I think uh, that's something that uh, paying attention to the game and be able to play the game and be out there a lot instead of, you know, one or two shifts a game, you know, be able to be involved and, you know, uh, through my the prime of my career, you know, I'd be playing 12 to 14 minutes. And, uh, you know, I think uh, when you're able to go out there and be a, a factor in the game with the, the physicality and stuff and, and still pay attention that uh, something happens when your teammates you can go out and take care of, that's, uh, you know, that's makes you a, a unique player. And I think that's something, um, you know, a lot of people don't realize that, uh, you know, for the most part, uh, a lot of the tough guys in the NHL, have to be able to play the game. Uh, and I do want to get to how you reinvented yourself uh, at the end of the, your career, but uh, do you miss, when I think of you at the end, or not even at the end, when you got done with a fight, especially in Ottawa, and you do it sometimes on the road, which even drive people more nuts, is how you throw your arms up in the air and try to rile up the crowd, right? So do you miss that euphoria, if you will, of the crowd just all in on you at that moment? So it's, it's funny. I, I, the reason I started doing that, um, honestly, like, uh, early on in my career was to let my mom know I was all right. Um, and, uh, are you being you know, serious? 100%. So my, cause my mom would, wouldn't talk to me till after the game and I'd have to call her after every game. And, uh, you know, and then when she passed away, I just, I just kept doing it in, in honor of her. And, uh, you know, I think that's something that a lot of people don't realize why, why I did it, but, uh, you know, I, my mom's always a firm believer, you know, you know, it's uh, these people are paying good money to, to watch you play. So make sure you show up and work hard every night. And, you know, that's, and she goes, you know, if you can give me a wink or a thumbs up or something to let me know if you're all right. So I'm like, Oh, I'll do, I'll, I'll do one better. But uh, anyway, it started in the minors uh, in Grand Rapids. So she'd uh, um, uh, tune in on her computer if she wasn't down there watching. And, you know, I, there'd be times, uh, you know, there's some tough guys in the minors that uh, would be absolutely killers up in the NHL, but they just can't play the game. So, you know, I had to, in the IHL, playing against those guys and and, and the AHL as well. But, um, you know, those uh, those guys are just there for one reason. And, uh, you know, I still remember I was fighting Mel Engelstead and uh, he ended up playing a couple of games with Washington Capitals. But, uh He's, uh, he was just an animal and, uh, you know, he went, uh, I don't know the whole story, but, uh, the rumor is that, uh, the coaches in Kalamazoo seen him uh, in a bar fight and anyway, they're like, can you skate? And he's like, yeah. And he's like, well, show up to the rink on Monday. And then <laughs> up. So I don't know if it's a hundred percent true or not, but, uh, anyway, I was fighting him and down the minors and, you know, he caught me with a couple and I just stopped and, you know, got the fans into it. And I started, uh, throwing my arm up in the air during the fight and kept on going. And, uh, I ate, I ate one or two, but, uh, you know, I was able to rebound and uh, come out on top. So. That is outstanding. I, I never knew that was why. I just thought you were showboating and then trying to be entertaining. So uh, I appreciate that story. I, I want to go back to the AHL quickly. When you started playing in the A – or, sorry, in the IHL, I want to say, like, what was your impression? Because uh, it no longer exists anymore, but it was, it was obviously a feeder league, not quite the same level as the AHL. Like, were you like, uh-oh, this is pro hockey, or what was it like? Well, the difference between the I and the A back in the day, like uh, they're comparable and it was, was skill, but uh, the IHL was a lot of older guys that yeah. uh, that have played in the NHL, and um, you know, uh, and the AHL was a lot of younger guys that were uh, you know flying around, lots of energy, lots of hits and stuff. So the I found the IHL was a little more um, skilled back in the day. Uh, you know, you have guys like Gary King down there that played uh, a ton of games. And, you know, the captain of our team was Ed Patterson. Uh, you know, so guys like that, um, and then you, and they also made uh, a little bit more money in the IHL because they, they pay them a little more. Uh, so they jump ship and go to the I instead of the A. And, uh, you know, had the privilege of playing with some awesome guys down there. And, uh, you know, it's 
just a great experience. And I think, um, you know, as a young kid going down, you go from coming out of junior, uh, you're a boy playing with men. And, uh, you know, if you go to the back then, if you went to the HL, there, you know, it was a lot of younger guys. So it's for the strength and stuff. Um, you know, for me, it was awesome to go to the IHL because, you know, the guys that uh, I was going against were men. And, uh, so I remember we're going, um, we're playing in Houston and, uh, I, I like getting to the game early and uh, so I'm walking in and got my coffee in my hand and uh, so the uh, guy by the name of Greg Walters was there and he's taping a stick and anyway I, I knew all about him and anyway did my homework and so I, I'm like I gotta fight this guy tonight and he's out there tape, taping a stick with a cut off t-shirt on and I, I look at he had Hulk Hogan arms and I'm like Holy, I gotta fight this guy at night so first shift out there we go at it and I, I did awesome and uh so they had um Barry Dragger there as well so anyway he comes up to me after the fight and he goes you and me were next and I'm like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> anyway that that was kind of it's like welcome to the the IHL so but I think it's um for a development league going down and playing the I and the A it, it teaches to respect the NHL that much more. And I think, uh, you know, for kids uh, coming out of junior or college to go down and learn the, the pro game and, um, you know, don't take it for granted to be in the NHL. And obviously there's certain circumstances that, uh, you know, the players go right into the NHL and, you know, they're capable of doing it like a McDavid or Crosby. But I think for the most part, um, you know, for people to respect the game and love the game and, uh, you know, go down there, you know, if uh, you're down there for, even a happy year it makes a difference. And, uh, you know, I think uh, NHL teams um, push kids to come up too soon and uh, it hurts their development. You were a sixth round pick. So did you ever think realistically you were going to play in the NHL? Uh, well, I, my, uh, my public school principal, uh, I, I still tell him the story. He goes, Chris, what do you want to do when you get older? I go, I'm going to play in the NHL. And, uh, so anyway, I go home. Uh, he's retired now, but um, anyway, he's uh, he always reminds me of that story. And uh, uh, right from a young age, that's something um, you know I I strive to to work at. And it, I know there's no guarantees, but uh, you know I'm pretty uh, stubborn stubborn. And you know if I <laughs> put my mind to something, I I, I want to do it and do it the best of my ability. And uh, you know that's something when I you know got to the NHL with the group that we had uh, in Ottawa with the you know, me being uh, one of two rookies on my the team my first year, we had an older group, and you know those guys uh, they wanted to get better every game and uh, every uh, every week, every practice, you name it, and uh, to see how how they worked and how they uh, strive to get better. And like guys like Alfie, you know, uh, he's the captain of your team, and you know, led by example, wasn't the most vocal, but uh, he always worked hard, and you know, first in the gym or you know, first on, and he. You know, so that that's something I always uh, cherished and, um, you know, try to put into my own game. And, you know, as even, uh, you know, playing 16 years in the NHL, um, you know, first one on the ice and usually one of the last ones off. And, you know, that just uh, you lead by example. OK, I want to skip ahead uh, to, uh, well, it's probably that your least favorite moment to talk about. And that's the 2017 playoff run because you only played the two games and it became a huge issue. But when you played that game five in round two against New York Rangers, did you start to come to life? Because you became a huge factor in both game five and in game six. Uh, and I, I just take us through it from your point of view. Well, obviously we had a good group of guys in there and um, you know, I think uh, near the end of the season, that's when I broke my, uh, my hand on Sean Port. And so I, I didn't play the last part of the the regular season and then um the guys were playing well um you know so it's it, you know as a professional guy uh, i treat it like a job and you know it's uh whatever the team needed to be and you know i think that's something uh when i came into the league uh you know you, you push out older guys and you know it was reality and you know that's so why it, it was what it was and you know i obviously you know i'm a competitive guy i want to be involved in play and you know, it's uh, with uh, the way uh, things were handled, I didn't necessarily um, didn't like, but um, and not just for my my own uh, scenario, like, uh, you know, on the, the on the, the coaching staff, uh, you know, how they treated other players and stuff. And, you know, like I said, I, I watch and pay attention to stuff. And, 
you know, it's something, uh, you know, when you're a authority figure um, overseeing 26 guys in playoffs, yeah, you know, you got to be able to engage, be able to communicate. And, um, you know, I just found that the, the coaching staff didn't do that. And, um, you know, how they treated some of the, the players and, you know, and Meth would vouch for that as well. But, uh, you know, for me, um, when I came into the lineup, uh, I, I, Kyle Turris got jumped by Tanner Glass the game before, and I almost came out of the press box. I was so mad. Uh, you know, uh, we had guys on the ice that uh, were – big enough to take care of things and they didn't I was I was human so anyway I I prepared like I was getting into the lineup and I I did and you know there was some hesitance from the coaching staff to to put me in and I, I think uh Elfie actually came in and told me was Chris you're gonna be in and uh you know that's something uh you know just do what you do and you know just back up your teammates and be smart out there and and you know that's what I did and uh so, and all the guys uh, were well aware of like Kyle Turris basically um, came up to me for the game and there were some other issues and stuff and just how they handled things. Like I came in and, you know, I was the assistant captain on the team and, you know, there was no, no way in my Jersey. And uh, I'm like, whatever, I'll deal with that at the end of the year. I'm like, and, but Kyle Turris actually came in. He was so mad that I'm coming in to, to stick up for him. And uh, he went into Boucher's office and basically said, you know, take my A off and put it on the other because, you know, he, he's a leader in there. And, you know, so that, you know, stuff like that meant a lot. So before the game even started, I go, guys, I go, I don't care how they treated me. I go, I want you guys to play with the biggest, biggest set of, you know, what out there. And uh, I go, cause no one's going to touch us. And uh, we went out there and Kyle Turst didn't have nine hits all year. He had nine hits that game. So, you know, that's uh just to, you know, put the, the courage in him and make him feel like uh, he's a guy that can go out and play his game and be involved in. Yeah. So, and it should have been, it should have been done earlier. Like, like there was a couple of us that were, that we would, and we would talk about it amongst ourselves. Obviously Neeler wasn't around at those, at those moments, but we always put so much emphasis in, into why we were asking these questions, you know, why is a Neeler playing right now? Like, how do we approach this? Do we just barge into the office and tell them or because it was apparent the way glass was running around that whole series and he was doing his job and he was very effective at it. But I mean, we need a kneeler in there so badly. So when he went in there and did what he did and kind of almost embarrassed the guy in front of all the fans, it was, it was brilliant. And I'm like, and all week we could think as teammates is we'd kill that penalty a hundred times over if kneeler wanted to go back out and do it just because that's how effective it was. And it, and it quieted him down. Like you didn't hear much about Tanner glass the rest of the round. And again, I'm not, I'm not, crapping all over Tanner Glass. He was doing his job. But when Neeler did that, it basically made him quiet for the rest of the series. And to me, that was probably the turning point of the whole round. So, I mean, it just spoke to how important Neeler was in that role when he came in and did what he did. So what was said to Neeler after the game in the room? Anything? Oh, uh, well, all the guys, all the guys yeah. were pumped. And, you know, I think, uh, like I said, I just do what I had to do for the team and the way the circumstances happened too, like uh, I literally was coming on the ice, uh, my line was up and, uh, you know, my, the right winger changed and I, I came flying on and literally glass had a delayed penalty. And I'm like, Oh, this is a perfect time. So, you know, like, like I said, I pay attention to the game. I know what's going on. So I go, well, even if I take an instigator, it's all right because it'll be evened out. So we already had to, and, you know, basically I came in and I, I caught him with some good punches, but uh, my hand was so swollen um that I had to get a froze for the next game so I couldn't even hold my stick so I didn't even know if I was going to be able to play the next game my my hand just went like shoot like that so I had to get a, a needle in here and here to freeze it and I and I don't like needles <laughs> really <laughs> yeah you don't like needles no I like I go to the dentist for uh root canal or whatever I don't get freezing I just let them drill <laughs> oh, what a Lord. lunatic like how does wow. he do that I've had a few root canals and I could tell you I would not sit in that chair without without the uh, the topical stuff they put in there, whatever it's called. It's it just goes to show you how tough that guy is. <laughs> yeah. I, one, a couple of things left on that game five is: were you to, were you told by the coaching staff, or was your name just put on a piece of paper on the or on the lines on the whiteboard in the room? Like, did they have any conversation with you going into that game? So basically what happened was um, I, Elfie told me I was going to be playing. So I showed up to the game like I normally do three, three, three and a half hours before to get ready and prepare. And, 
you know, I, I just like getting to the rink early and uh, I throw my own music on because not everyone likes it. But uh, anyway, uh, so I just get in my own zone and uh, tape my sticks and stuff. So actually Boucher came in. He's like, you're in tonight. I go, I know. That's what I said to him. And anyway, uh, he's like, well, I need you to be, uh, need you to be disciplined out there. And, and I, I said to him, I, you know, I, I'd, I'd had enough and, you know, how he, he treated Ryan to Zingle, like, not very good. So I was a little upset on how he did that. Like I said, uh, you know, I care about my teammates and my, you know, and that's, uh, I said, you do yourself a favor. You haven't talked to me. Uh, you haven't talked to me for three months. Don't start now. And then I turned and walked away. And, you know, that's, uh, like I said, I always, I knew um, I had the, the logo on the front, uh, not the name on the back. And you know, I knew what I had to do for the team. And, you know, that's, that's the, that's how, we went that far. It wasn't uh, any systems or anything. It was the group of guys, how we came together. And Matt, you can vouch for that. You know, the year after, you know, uh, we, we started to go downhill and um, uh, like the sense that you were gone, I was gone, Kells was gone, you know, so you had some good uh, veteran presence that um, could keep a, a room together. And, uh, you know, so there, there was uh, some growing periods, but, you know, for me, uh, watching the group now, uh, seeing um, the young guys and how they're taking control, like a Brady to Chuck and, you know, uh, Thomas Shabbat, how they're taking control of the team and it, it's their team. And, you know, that's how it was. And, you know, you look back at that day, uh, uh, back in the 2017, uh, yeah, we had older guys, but uh, it wasn't our team. It was, uh, you know, the Zach Smith, the Mark Stones, the Pajols, those were the guys that, you uh, you know, we're the, the core group of guys and we were just support cast for them. And, you know, that's, uh, as you get older, you know, that's what you're there for. And, um, you know, I think, uh, you know, it's, it's good to have those types of players around and, uh, as a support cast, but, uh, you know, those, um, those, uh, mid tier guys that, uh, you know, they're in their prime, you know, those are the guys that you want to lead your team and, you know, they're going to be out there a lot and, you know, you want them to do it right. And, you know, as older guys, you just got to be there and, you know, guide them in the right direction. A uh, couple of, one thing is there was near the end, I'll say near the end of your career. I'm not, I can't remember way back because I'm too old to remember all the years. Uh, there was talk about you being traded at the deadline. Was that ever uh, talked about with you? Did it ever, how close was that? And why didn't you uh, think about perhaps going somewhere else where you could have a chance at a cup? Well, the year I retired, um, you know, I had a couple teams interested. Uh, I had offers from other teams and it just uh, didn't seem like a right fit. Montreal was interested. Uh, Bo Julian actually called me and, you know, I had a great chat with them. And anyway, uh, they didn't have any contracts. Um, they wanted me to come on a PTO. He goes, Chris, come on a PTO. You'll be on my team. He goes, um, and I'm like, uh, so I call him back and I was looking into like disability insurance and stuff. If I go there, get hurt in training camp and all of a sudden they can just walk away and I'm back home rehabbing and, you know, having my wife and my kids look after me and that, that's not fair to them. So that's, uh, I, I called him back and I said, uh, I go, no offense, but, uh, you know, if you guys want me, you know, let's, let's get a deal done. And they're like, you still want you just be patient. And so anyway, uh, they actually got off to a rough start that year. And anyway, uh, they called me back and they're like, no offense, Chris, but uh, we need goal scoring. They weren't scoring goals. And, and I go, well, you put me on the power play and get you 20. So <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> they, um, you know, they had a good, good chuckle about it, but uh, so they, they actually tried to address their goal scoring. And anyway, this didn't pan out. And for me, I had already kind of made up my mind if that wasn't, going to make a, a fit in Montreal then I'd be done uh, you know obviously uh, growing up I was a Montreal fan uh, they were my favorite team uh, Denny Savard Patrick Waugh were some of my favorite players so you know to be able to have an opportunity to play there would have been awesome at the end but in saying that I don't regret um, you know playing my whole career in Ottawa and being a, a lifer here it's uh, I love I love the city love the team uh, you know, I love the the people that are around uh, that are retired here that have, you know, played for the team. And, uh, you know, it's just you can't say enough about it. Um, you know, so I, I don't regret my decision at all. And you know, I'm glad that uh, I can say I, I played for one team my whole career. Well, funny you say that because I have a stat here. There have been 8,079 different players to play in the history of the NHL uh, at the time of this conversation. Only 40 players have played 1,000 or more games with just a single franchise 
including you. One of 40. It's a phenomenal number. And I think obviously you're proud of it. I, when you got to that thousand games, which I think was in LA, uh, what's that moment like? Other than the fact you got fancy new sticks. <laughs> uh, you know what? It was, it was an awesome, uh, exciting time. Uh, you know, I think, uh, I still remember uh, when um, Elfie got his and, um, you know, he, Eugene actually came down and, uh, you know, gave Elfie a speech. And anyway, he goes, yeah, there's, uh, he goes, this is just uh, one of a bunch of guys that are here that are going to get me, he named Philly, he named me. And I'm like, oh man, I, I was at like 500 games at that point. And I'm like, oh, that's a long way, but I, I think I can do it. So <laughs> anyway, uh, you know, to be able to get there and, um, you know, uh, and all with one team, it, uh, it truly is uh, an awesome uh, team itself. But uh, honestly, play the the way I did, um, you know, that's uh, that was the challenge. Uh, I played as long as I did because I didn't change my role. Um, you know, I knew what I had to do. I didn't think I was someone I wasn't. Uh, the one year I was on the power play, I had 16 goals that year. Uh, I didn't come in the next year and think, okay, well, I'm an offensive guy now. And so I just, I stayed my role and, uh, you know, just played uh, the way I had to and uh, that kept me going. And, you know, I think uh, I'd be able to play a thousand games and, uh, you know, uh, obviously it would have been nice to, to do it at home, but uh, the LA Kings were awesome. Um, when I had it there, uh, you know, they, they gave me a sweep to the game. I had a bunch of family members down at it and, uh, you know, a nice bottle of wine that uh, I just, I drank not too long ago with the wife. So, uh, at a certain date, you had to drink it. But anyway, um, it was awesome. <laughs> it's, just a, it's a great experience and um, be able to, you know, to have that, uh, you know, experience and um, be able to share with my family that uh, gave up so much to or sacrificed so much for me to do play the game I love to play. Okay, so you've gone through now all the, well, I guess the 2D to the 3D logo and now it's back to the 2D. A couple of jerseys in there. Well, actually, a lot of jerseys. What's the ugliest jersey you played in? And uh, do you prefer the 2D or the 3D logo? Um, I like the 2D, but uh, I'm old school that way. And uh, I I think uh, one of my favorite jerseys is, though, the um, the outdoor game in uh, Vancouver, yeah. the, the yeah. green color ones. The I, 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 I agree. absolutely love those. And anyway, uh, but uh, the old uh, the old black ones with um, sense. Yeah, I probably got one in the garage here somewhere. But uh, <laughs> back in the day, they is like uh, if you got skating too fast, they were like a parachute you you take off. So anyway, I didn't have to worry about that. <laughs> uh, you brought up earlier about the new look Ottawa Senators and Brady Kachuk, Thomas Shabbat, of course. You know Drake Batherson, Tim Stutzla, Josh Norris, Colin White, those guys. What do you think about this group that's been assembled here, at least up front anyway? Well, we've, we've been very fortunate. Um, you know, obviously the last couple of years haven't been great years, but uh, be able to draft, uh, you know, you can get high picks. Um, you know, Stutzel has been unbelievable. Uh, he just come into his own. And, uh, you know, a, a guy like Brady to Chuck, um, you know, he, he reminds me of myself and, you know, not as a hockey player, but, you know, he plays physical and, you know, he's very gifted uh, offensively. But, uh, you know, I, I, I just sat back the one day at um, the skills competition and, um, you know, watched him. Uh, and he came off the ice. He signed every single autograph for every single kid that wanted one. And, uh, you know, that says a lot about him. And, uh, you know, you, you want those guys in your team. You want them in your community. And, you want them to be leaders in your community. And he has that, uh, that background on him. So, you know, to be able to see that firsthand and um, just how he engages with people, it's, uh, it truly is awesome. And, uh, you know, hopefully a lot of the other um, kids in the well, kids, men in that locker room, follow him and, uh, you know, take, take suit after him because uh, you know, that's uh, what I, I came into with guys like Wade Redden and, uh, you know, Chris Phillips, you know, being involved in the community, giving back to the community. And that's what it really is about, uh, you know, hockey secondary. And, you know, we got to play a game we love to play, but uh, to make a difference in your community and uh, be embedded in the community, that's what it's really about. Neiler, do you, you think he's, is he the captain? Would you give I, him your endorsement? I 100% I would. I think uh, there's a guy you want to keep around. And, uh, you know, I think, um, you know, obviously there's guys there with that have played more games and stuff, but, uh 
he doesn't like uh, losing. He does whatever he has to do. And, uh, you know, when you have a skill guy and playing in your top uh, six forwards, uh, he's not afraid to drop it. He reminds me of a uh, uh, Getzlav or, you know, he's uh, yeah. do whatever he has to do to, to get things done and plays physical. Uh, you know, I think he's top two or three in the league in uh, body checks this year. And, uh, yeah. you know, obviously um, as he gets older, you'll have to modify that a bit because of the toll on his body. But, you know, he's a, uh, he's, built like a different breed and I think uh you know he's a big guy and he, and he loves that part of the game too so that's uh old school hockey and you know I, I love it and you know he, he definitely would have my endorsement to be the, the captain of the team yeah and he's creating and he's creating space for himself the way he's playing now right like you guys know like at one point in your career I can vouch because I played against you when I was playing in Columbus I didn't want to go near you on the ice because I knew about you and the type of player you were so I feel like Brady's probably kind of doing that too right like the more the more he gets involved with the rough stuff it's probably giving him a little more space maybe two or three seasons down the road uh, absolutely and uh, you know obviously the guys that uh, play with him uh, reap the benefits of it as well and uh, yeah. you know you look at uh, Colin White played quite a bit with him last year I believe um, I you know Wally you know a little more of that but uh Colin White had a, a great offensive year last year, but, uh, you know, it's because Brady created a lot of space for him and, uh, you know, had, uh, you know, had that opportunity to play with a guy like that. And, and you can't say enough about that. Uh, you know, you want uh, those D to be back on their heels if he's coming in to, you know, finish a check on them and, you know, they might throw the puck a little quicker and, you know, uh, yeah. turn over and uh, guys capitalize on their opportunity. Uh, quickly, speaking of old school, and you brought it up, and we've always talked about this. You never were suspended at once in your career, although uh, the Buffalo Sabres tried awfully hard to do that a couple of times, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, I, I should almost ask you about the fact that they sent a letter to the league uh, trying to have you suspended for your hit on Tim Connolly. Is could you play in today's game? Like, because you were on the line uh, back in the old days, and I'm thinking now, would you find yourself probably in a suspension or two? Um. Well, you go back to watch some of those hits and stuff and, you know, you can go, you can go across the whole league, not just me yeah. and myself, like, um, you, know, uh, you know, Scott Stevens, you know, there's another one, you know, uh, in today's game, the way it is, but, uh, you know, it's a, it's a fine line. Uh, you know, it's uh, when you're a physical guy, a floor checker and, you know, you want to be that physical presence on the ice crate time and space for your teammates. Um, you know, it, it is a fine line and, you know, whether you cross one side or the other. And, uh, you know, I think, um, you know, you look at some of them, like that might hit on Chris Drury. It was, uh, you bro break it down into like, like seconds. It's like one steamboat, two steamboat. And then I finished my check and he was a mire in his pass. And, Anyway, those are the ones, uh, you know, and I, I call them, um, they're almost like tracking. So like you're putting back pressure uh, um, and a guy funnels them into the middle and you, you just, it's a timing thing. And, you know, that's what makes people good hitters. And, you know, I think, uh, you know, one of the things, and Matt, you do this very well too, when you've played, um, you know, when you hit a guy, you, you hit to go through them. You don't want to see anyone get hurt, but um, if you, you let up, um, someone's going to get hurt, whether it's yourself or the other guy. And, you know, like I, I still remember uh, one of the only times I ever let up was on Chris Kelly um, when he was with Boston and he came through the middle and I kind of, I'm like, Oh, frig, that's Chris, that's Kells. So I'm like, Oh, I don't want to hit him. So I kind of get, try to get out of his way. He went the same way and I ended up breaking his legs. So, you know, it's uh, he didn't talk to me for a bit, but. <laughs> <laughs> that, well, you hit, so you're good friends with Mike Fisher. And I just, I watched, He's in Nashville. He's the captain at the time, so it must have been near the end of his career. You dropped him uh, in the offensive zone. Did he ever say anything to you after that? No, I, I would like whenever I put that jersey on, whatever team, whether it's men's league or whatever, I'm going out and I'm playing hard and doing whatever I have to do. But uh, you know, I think um, I always said like I, you go back to like fighting Char and stuff uh, when he was on our team. Um, it was actually the summer that. Uh, he ended up uh, signing in Boston. And, uh, you know, I think, um, you know, he, he basically said we were training in the gym. He goes, Chris, he goes, if I ever, uh, or, he goes, Neiler, he goes, if I ever played on another team, uh, you never fight me. I go, see, I'd, I'd fight you 100%, I said. So, and, um, you know, so, and it didn't happen right away, like, you know, five years in, but, you know, he has a job to do. And, uh, you know, I think, 
he wasn't even playing the, the game before and Dennis Seidenberg speared me in front of the net and I didn't like it. And anyway, I, I punched him great, great in the visor and broke his visor and split him open. So anyway, um, you know, Z came up and the next game, uh, I think it was like a week or two later, he was back in the lineup and uh, I'm, I'm taping my stick in the, in Boston's arena. And we're literally, we're just chatting. And he's like, Oh, Neil, how are you? How's the family? And I'm like, Oh, good. Did you get your house built? And you know, he built a Linwood home. Uh, so anyway, uh, we were kind of chatting back and forth. We chatted for about 10, 15 minutes. And then um, first shift of the game, and I, go, I hear Neil, are Oh, so anyway, uh, I see, I see a Z and the puck was coming around the boards. I'm like, hold on a second. So I got the puck came around on my wing. I put it back down. I'm like, okay, let's go now. So he's like, huh? <laughs> caught him off guard. Cause he, I don't know if he really thought I was going to fight him. That's funny. You dropped him. Yeah. <laughs> well, he has to get inside on him cause he's a big dude. <laughs> you brought up men's league. Um, well, Matthew, why don't you just take over? Well, no, it's not a big deal. I just, I know some of the guys that skate with Neil are in men's league, right? So they tell me how competitive he gets and how he can be an absolute nightmare to play with in the, in the corners and stuff. So I think Neil already covered it though. He's pretty competitive, even in men's league. Do you, you haven't fought anybody on the ice there though, Neil, have you? Just my brother. <laughs> Why? Well, he was, um, my brother's, uh, he's a good player and, uh, he's six, four and, Anyway, uh, he was kind of getting out of hand. Uh, I was on one team, he was on the other. And uh, so a couple of my buddies had them all wound up. And anyway, uh, so I, I was the only one on the ice that could actually step in and, you know, uh, kind of tame them down. And anyway, that's kind of what happened. And so well, what happened? <laughs> what happened in the fight? Uh, he actually, um, he's a lefty. So I actually just kind of grabbed him by the left and, you know, I, there was like three punches thrown and then everyone else kind of came in. So it was pretty funny. <laughs> but, uh, and we went, we had a beer in the dressing room after. Oh, I Neil, I shouldn't that be up with any. That's amazing. <laughs> All right. All right a, a couple of questions before we let you go. One is uh, you brought up music. I'm curious what, what music then would you be playing? What would be the three songs at the top of your playlist to get you in the room, in the locker room, ready for the game? Well, uh, I get, like I said, I'm old school, like uh, Thunderstruck, ACDC, like stuff like that, Guns N' Roses, you know, I, I just, and they have a, a guy in the room now, um, Brom Carp, and he kind of helps out in the locker room, and anyway, uh, he get to the rink at the same time, and he could hear the music just blaring out, and it's all old school, he comes in playing the air, the air guitar, he's got to go on, and anyway, we used to have fun, he'd be booting around but uh you know I, I i love that all but i i also i enjoy everything like uh you know i i do enjoy multiple uh genres and you know i think that's uh you know something um but as far as getting pumped up i, I like the old the old uh the old stuff like acdc and stuff like that and and neiler would have it so loud to the point where like because i'd be coming to the rink and half the time i'm grumpy because i'm tired from the night before and I'm rolling into the rink relatively early and the music is just cranked. And it's like four in the afternoon. Like we're not playing. We're not playing till seven or seven thirty. And he's already got the music full blast. Like I haven't had a coffee yet. And Neeler, you left a song out. Sometimes you'd have that Miley Cyrus song playing at Party in the USA or what was it called? <laughs> no, you have I, a I, I don't know that one. <laughs> I, thought, I thought you'd have one of those. It was just and it drove me nuts. But he's right. He'd play Thunderstruck and stuff like that, too. But some of the guys, like, we'd walk in and be like, and we didn't know how to turn it off because we don't want to get Neeler all pissed off with us. So we'd have to, like, <laughs> we'd have to go in there and, like, slowly taper it down. <laughs> hey, but yeah. I, I was good, though, Matt, because I'd always cut it off at a certain point and let yeah, you uh, did. Smitty, Smitty take it over. So Oh, yeah, and Smitty would play And his, you like, guys would complain rock. about his music. Yeah, and then his music <laughs> sucked, too. But anyway, yeah, there's always drama, music drama. Uh, hey, hey, part of the reason though, Matt, is because you drink those little wee tiny cups of coffee. You gotta have a full <laughs> one. You gotta have a large one for a game to get pumped up. But uh, well, I tried. So once I got to Dallas and I was always playing injured, I'd have like a friggin' liter of coffee every game. So I can relate. <laughs> I get it. I wish you'd take hey, some more coffee now. You tend to be more crankier as you get older. I'm hey, Wally, cranky. when uh, Matt takes you out for uh, when you guys go out for dinner with each other, um, does yeah. he get mad if you order dessert? We've gone out once, 
Um, <laughs> and it wasn't for dinner, and he did pay for it. Oh, oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. But I think that's because everybody knew him around, and so they went. He's like, no, no, I got the bill. No, like he's he's making Neeler's, sure everybody knows. Neeler's not talking about that. He's well, there is that because I am frugal. But he's saying, because I used to snap when guys would order desserts because I just wanted to go back to the hotel room. Like, I was just tired, probably, and grumpy. And Neil some like, of the guys. Uh, dividing the bill up. If someone got dessert and we divided the bill up. Okay, that, that okay. Like <laughs> <laughs> right. This comes up almost every conversation we have with his former teammates. It's his nightly dinner routine. I'm <laughs> hey, did, you, did he tell you the nickname uh, Yuckmouth? Yeah, no. Wait, wait, wait. Why did you call me yuck mouth again? Because I would eat well, everything. Because you shoved everything in your mouth on the airplane. <laughs> you look like a steagle at the dump. <laughs> <laughs> that, but I the airplane he, stuff is good, though. Oh, uh, you started calling me yuck mouth. It drove me nuts. It's such a, it's such a, it's just such a shitty nickname to have. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. look at yuck mouth. Come and get this food over here. There's like a buffet line set up, and I'd run over and just load up a plate. <laughs> And then have like a glass of wine and I'd just be cramming everything in there anyway. But good times. That's one of the, the one of the biggest things I miss though is the camaraderie and uh, you know, seeing Same. the guys when you're when you're done. And you know, I obviously when Meth came over, uh, you know, um, we traded a beauty for a beauty, Nick Felino mm-hmm. for Mark Mathot. And you know, it's uh, you know, have uh, guys like that and you know, obviously Matthew will vouch too, you know, you and me spend a lot of time together on the road, whether it's dinners or whatever, and you know, it's uh you know, you, Fun, you can take back that kind of stuff. So yeah, you know, that's something you miss. I say the same thing every time people ask me like about the game, because I'm retired now too, and it's always the same thing. I miss like the dinners on the road, like the night before the game, like it wasn't even a game day. Or, or even like a regular game day practice where there's no stress about having to play a game that day. You just go in, get in there early. Guys are telling stories, messing around. Like that's, that's the stuff I think as players or athletes in general, I think we miss the most. It's just the camaraderie. Like, like Neeler said. I'd say the same. Like I missed being in that yeah. locker room, even with the players, you know, with Neeler, I think Neeler and Yarko Rutu were probably the most ruthless uh, when it came to handling me, but they were like, that made it a lot more entertaining, interesting, and so I thought it was always fun. So I understand like the, the missing of that locker room and it's for several people, right? Like it was a good time, whether you liked being on camera or being interviewed, it was still fun to chat with other people that weren't always, I guess, the same teammates you had every day. So uh, that stuff is always good. I, I Before we go um, for people who can't see or at least listening on the podcast, you're sitting in front of a Zamboni. Now I know you have a new job, but I don't think it's a Zamboni driver. You want to explain? Well, I, I put an outdoor rink up for the kids and, you know, I was out flooding and shoveling flooding. And so anyway, uh, I, um, I'm like, it's a 40 by a hundred and that's a, it's a big rink. So I'm like, ah, I found this Zamboni online and anyway, ended up getting it and it's been awesome. It, uh, never driven one before. So, uh, all the years in the rink, never had the opportunity to get on one. I've always wanted to. So um there is a couple holes in the boards for me driving but uh <laughs> it's uh my my ice has been awesome though it really has it makes a world of difference so i can must say if you have an outdoor rink that's uh big enough get a zamboni buy a zamboni <laughs> i can just see you driving around in the summer you probably probably put some like the lawnmower thing on the bottom of it if you can yeah i, I want to put in the carp parade <laughs> you might as well I'll go- I'll go if you do that. That would be incredible. <laughs> I'll get you uh, a top mess for the for our alumni. We'll throw some candy. I'll be there. <laughs> just throw just throw candy at kids from. from uh, the hey, you'll have a hard time not eating it though. Uh, that's true. That's true. Uh, finally, you do have a new job, and that's we're coming up in the fall, I guess. Uh, you're going to be an instructor with the uh, Ottawa Senators hockey program or hockey academy. Uh, do you want to take us through that? Yeah, so I, I had the uh, I got asked to be a part of it, and uh, you know I I love uh, being on the ice with the kids, and you know help give back, and uh, you know I look at me, I always look back in uh, my hockey career, people that made a difference in uh, where how effective my life, and you know how to push me, and how to make you strive to get better, and uh, you know so for me to get involved uh, with a school and be able to be on the ice with the kids and uh, Get back to the game that's what it's really about and 
you know, I think um, I coach minor hockey, uh, you know, as well. And, uh, you know, it's, it's fun and, uh, you know, be able to take uh, all the different coaches we had in Ottawa, be able to take all the good, good stuff that, uh, that I really enjoyed from them and, and put it into myself and, you know, how, how stuff really affected me on the ice and, um, you know, how it got me better. And, you know, I think uh, I learned a lot from Brian. Brian Murray was awesome. Um, you know, uh, but John Paddock was another good one. Paul McLean, you know, guys like that, uh, you know, get the game. They, you know, they, they get uh, all the different personalities that you, you have to work with and how you make them all one. And uh, I think that's uh, something that I really enjoy and uh, be able to be involved with that. It's, it's going to be fun. Well, Neeler, for 16 years, I got to cover you and uh, watch you play and talk to you all after the game. It has been an absolute pleasure for 16 years, but this was a, a lot of fun. And uh, it's the longest interview we've done. So poor Craig is going to have to figure out how to make this show work. But we appreciate every minute because it's been a blast. Thank you. Oh, thanks for having me on, guys. Anytime. Good to see you, Matt. <laughs> you know what? Well, actually, that was a good ending there. Well, we never asked him his favorite snack. We My did favorite it. snack? Yeah. What's yeah. your favorite snack? What's your favorite snack? We uh, asked everybody be, on the show. Before game? No, just no, in so, general. Your favorite cheat snack. So if, oh, you, cheat if you're snack. sitting at home one night watching a movie or whatever, what's the one cheat snack you would have? Those uh, right now is those uh, the mini eggs, the Easter uh, mini eggs. Oh, Those are awesome. Unbelievable. Really balls. good. I eat them all. We have a ton for our kids for Easter here yeah. in a couple of days, and I've already gone through half of them, so I get it. Yeah, no, those are good. But uh, I, you know, one, one of the other thing too, I also like uh, licorice. Yeah. Uh, black and or red? Red, definitely red. Yeah. <laughs> I don't like licorice. Zambuca. No, that stuff's <laughs> tough. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Uh, All right. We're going to slide that in somehow into the interview. But uh, <laughs> we appreciate it, my friend. Take care. Hey, good to see you guys. See you in the old dog. You I'm back. Okay. Welcome back to the show. We go from NHL veteran in Chris Neal, a longtime Ottawa Senator, to two of the future stars of the organization. Pleased to be joined now by Shane Pinto. And we only know him as JBD, but his real name is Jacob Bernard Docker. Guys, welcome to the show. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thank you. All right, let's just get first through this whole travel. I won't call it a schmazzle. Maybe it is. You guys explain to me the time you leave North Dakota and arrive in Ottawa and what that's been like. Yeah, yeah, I'll start. Uh, yeah. yeah it, was a bit of, it was a bit of a long day of travel, I think, just because of um, all of COVID and um, trying to find a direct flight, I think, was pretty good. But um, everyone in the organization has been super good to us. And you know, we got to the hotel and had a bunch of snacks waiting for us on our uh, counter. So it's been uh, it's been good. But, um, you know, we're getting through it together. How long was that drive? So you drive from North Dakota to Minnesota? Minneapolis. Yeah, that's about four and a half hours. And then we had... Uh, two two flights so a connecting flight and then drive from montreal because we couldn't fly into ottawa it's a long day um do you guys get along pretty well in the entire time yeah oh, we yeah. had no problems yeah there's no problems <laughs> no fighting uh, and was it tough uh on a grander scale to leave to make that final decision to put pen to paper and, and leave north dakota after you guys have had such a great program there um, yeah, I think, um, I said in my other podcast with the people, it was probably the hardest decision I had to make in my life. Um, I think Jacob could attest to it. It's just such a special place and the people there, the culture that they have, the fans, um, there's no better place for a hockey player to grow. And, you know, I think we're going to miss that place very much, but, you know, I think we're very excited to be here as well. So it's, it's all good stuff, but yeah, it was, it was definitely tough. Jake. You? Yeah, I mean, I think Pinner said it pretty much on the dot. Um, probably the best three years of my life um, in terms of just like away from the rink, meeting people and, and creating new relationships and as well as on the ice. Um, you know, I think our teammates and coaches were obviously something super special there. But like Pinner said, we're we're so pumped to be here and kind of get things started with Ottawa. You guys, uh, you guys touched on the coaches staff there. I had a pleasure of playing for Brad Berry in Columbus like 10 years ago. So that's how much older I am than you guys. But um, <laughs> He was a, he was our D coach and like super chill, calm demeanor. I'm curious. What was he like as a head coach there? 
Yeah, I think. Um, yeah, you, you go, go Jenner. No, no, you go, you go. All right. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I think uh, just like you said, like just super calm. Um, you know, I think our assistant coach, uh, one of our assistant coaches, Dane Jackson, kind of he was more energetic. But I think you know, Bubs is kind of just just so calm and relaxed behind the bench and always has a game plan. Um, and you know, when everyone's super rowdy and you know maybe a, a call doesn't go our way and guys are yelling at the refs, Bubs is just his heart rate's at you know eighty sitting on the bench and telling <laughs> everyone to calm down. So um, he was unbelievable for both the for both me and Pinner and our careers there. Did he ever raise his voice once ever? Because I, I don't I don't think I could tell you what he sounds like when he's angry. He's so soft spoken. <laughs> yeah, I think there's uh, one time that comes to mind in Duluth. I think it might have been my freshman year when he came in and chucked a a Powerade jug and kind of spilled it everywhere <laughs> after the end of the period we were getting dummied. But other than that, I think uh, nothing really comes to mind. Awesome. Can you guys, uh, last question about UND, take us through, the, I know it's a tough game, the last game, just because of uh, n- very few people I ever play through a four overtime type game going into the fifth one. Like, uh, I hate to bring it up, I guess, but can you explain what that night was like? Um, yeah, I think, uh, you know, I think most of the game, I thought we were playing well and you know, I, I didn't think we were going to lose that game that whole time. Even when we were down to nothing, um, I just think we had such belief in each other that we were going to come back and we ended up coming back with a minute, uh, and 30 left and, you know, the place went nuts and it was just such an emotional roller coaster. It was insane. You know, once we got back for that fourth overtime, the boys were just laughing. We couldn't believe that it was, it was, it was still going. It was like 1230 at night and we're like, you know, when is this going to end? But, you know, throughout, you know, each intermission, we, we, we kept thinking we were going to win and we had no doubt in our mind. And obviously the way it ended, it was just crushing. And, you know, it's hard, it's still hard to swallow. Honestly, I can't, I, it's hard to think about, but like I said, you got to move on, but yeah, it was definitely a special experience. I'll never forget that night, but um, yeah, it was, it was definitely tough though. So. We've talked in the past about like meth has what they, you guys try and do during intermissions. And if you're stuffing, you know, power bars and all that, and he's drinking Coke or whatever, was there any food left after the fourth overtime? Like, what are you guys trying to do to make sure you're hydrated and trying to get some energy? (laughs) A lot of the boys had Cokes on them. You know, they, they drank a couple of Cokes throughout the uh, periods. Uh, Three of us got IVs. I had an IV. I think Kawaguchi and Adams got an IV going into the fifth overtime, it didn't really work out because we only used it for one shift and then they scored. So that, that was kind of <laughs> worthless, but um, yeah, it was Coke. Um, I think we had some mustard getting passed around. A lot of the guys are having mustard. Um, those were the two that kind of stuck out the Coke and the mustard. I think those were the two. So Did, wait, you guys said you had I, like a bunch of you were getting IVs in between periods, like during the intermission. Like, so the, well, I can't imagine that being the case. Like we don't even have those resources at the NHL level. So how do you know? <laughs> so all- they have a bunch of nurses lined up just plugging <laughs> your, plug your arms in? Like, well, how does that work? Um, we had like our, uh, our training staff and we have like a couple of doctors that travel with us and there was only four IVs and I think three of us took it. So it was only three guys who, t- who took it, but still, still it, it was pretty impressive. insane, honestly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> So, so Jacob, as a defenseman, what's it like to play in that type of game? I, I didn't see your final minutes, but I, I can't imagine how high that number is. Yeah, I think someone was saying the, the unofficial time was right around 55 minutes or something like that. <laughs> um, but yeah, like Pinner said, like as as uh, tough as it was to lose that game, I think it was it's something that like I'll never forget the dressing room scene, like like Pinner said, between the, the periods and guys having like eight or nine water bottles in their stalls and their goalie also had to get an IV cause he couldn't walk. They had to pull him in the, I think it was a third of the fourth overtime where they had to get yeah. a new goalie coming in. And yeah. um, I'll just, I'll just never forget guys laying down in the room and, you know, our coach coming in, giving speeches and, and guys are on their back, having their legs up, um, you know, in their stalls. Um, so it was a pretty special, um, you know, thing to be a part of. All right, let's move on to happier times. Now you're in Ottawa. What do you know about Ottawa actually? Like if, have you guys done any research on what's around? I've got, uh, I've got a cousin that lives here actually. Um, so she lives around, I think she lives in downtown actually. Um, uh-huh. and also some friends that, um, my parents are both from the Maritimes. My dad grew up in Nova Scotia, my mom in New Brunswick. So, uh, we've got friends that actually come out, um, 
my dad grew up uh, going to Pictou Island, it's called, in the summer. So we got friends that we met out there that actually live in Ottawa as well. So I've got a few ties. Uh, where's your mom from? Uh, Black River, New Brunswick. I'm from Fredericton. So oh, we're right. all, we're all, yeah, we're all friends now. Um, <laughs> when you, have you done any research then, Shane, I'm going to go with you on the Ottawa senators. What do you know about the history? Just throwing them under the bus. Yeah. Right yeah. Now. We're going to see here. Um, uh, you know, honestly, not a whole lot. I know, um, I watched a lot of their games when I think it was 2017 or 2018 when they made that run. Um, and they lost to the Penguins with that Kunitz. Uh, I don't know if it was overtime or double overtime, but, you know, obviously I knew they were really good, you know, that year and I was kind of following them. But other than that, I, I had no idea. Once I got drafted, I kind of tried to get up somewhat of an idea, but still, I don't, I don't know too much. Obviously I know, you know, Alfredson's probably their, you know, you know their legendary player here. But other than yeah. that, I don't know much to be honest. Have you heard of Mark Mathot? <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. I remember you got I, you got you got your finger slashed. I don't know if it was Cosby uh, or one of those guys. I love how that's my claim to fame now. Is the finger, <laughs> like of all the things, it's <laughs> but I, I, it's all good. I, uh, yeah, yeah. No, no, it's funny. <laughs> it's funny. Wally brought that up because like when I was drafted by Columbus, my mom was like, "Okay, if you if you guys get grilled with questions." I need you to know what you're doing there. And I'm like, what are you talking about? So the old Columbus blue jacket symbol had like 13 stars around it. And I had to do my research with the symbol. And I'm like, okay, that means there's 13 colonies at the time. And uh, it also symbolized patriotism. So that's why I was wondering if you guys do anything about the team at all or the history of the no. team. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Obviously not. <laughs> <laughs> that's okay. Um, yeah. Shane, are you, or sorry, JBD, are you getting number 24? That's the number you've worn at, at UND. Yeah, I'm never, I haven't really talked to anyone about that. So um, I guess that's something we'll kind of find out when we get to the rink. But. Okay. Uh, Shane, you're a little different unless you're going to ask Nikita Zaitsev to hand it over number 22. Uh, Have you given any thought? Um, I definitely, I'm not going to ask him because he's playing the NHL for a bit. So he definitely deserves that. Um, um, I'm probably either going to try to go at number 12 um, if, if that's available or number 66 if that's available. Those are my two you, options. Usually when players join a new team, they buy that guy a Rolex for the number. So there's do you, <laughs> I do you, have, I do that. Do you have the funds to buy him a Rolex? <laughs> no, I can't do that yet. <laughs> All right, fair enough. Yeah, uh, no, I'm not, I don't need it that bad. <laughs> number 66, eh? I was just curious, like most people don't want to go near guys who have – you know, like a Mario Lemieux type career. So interesting. You, you don't mind the 66. Yeah, no, six plus six equals 12. I, and 12 is my favorite number. So if I don't get 12, I'd be 66. So that's my thought process. Um, I, I hope you Lemieux. take 66. I'm praying. Because <laughs> <laughs> you're going to get verbally assaulted. I know. I, know. I, I didn't even think about Mario Lemieux about that. I didn't even think, I think about that. Yeah, ho I think it was that, that Ho Sang, right? Came into the NHL Josh a couple Ho's years yes. ago. Yeah. And he wore 66. And I remember playing against him. And all I could think was like, what is this guy doing? <laughs> we just saved you, I think. You're welcome. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I think I'm just gonna stick with number 12 or I'll find another number. <laughs> the um, and there was a great center who wore number 12, and that's Mike Fisher, one of the all-time greats yeah. of the Ottawa Senators. So hey, perfect number for you. Is yeah, absolutely. uh I know you don't know which game you're likely to play. There's people are talking about either the, you know, the 14th or the 17th, the 14th would be home to Winnipeg and the 17th, I think is in Montreal. Of course, game numbers can change uh, on a daily basis. It seems lately with the schedule being messed up. Would you prefer, and I know you don't care which game you're playing because you want to play your first NHL game. Would you prefer it to be at home or on the road? Um, no, I don't think it, it matters. Obviously that first game is really special no matter where it is. So, I'm just going to try to enjoy the experience wherever it is. I'm not going to try to put too much pressure on myself. Just go out there and play hockey. You know, it's just a game and just have some fun with it. So, JBD? Yeah, I think the same as, as Pinner. Yeah. Um, I actually grew up, I know this is not good as a, a, a Sens, uh, in a Sens <laughs> organization now, but I grew up a Montreal fan. Um, <laughs> I guess that would be pretty cool. And um, I know Penner's favorite player is Mark Scheifele, if I'm not make, yeah. uh, mistaken. So I think both would be pretty awesome. Wow, cool. this fits in perfectly here. So uh, why a Montreal fan? If Did you not grow up in Alberta? Yeah, I grew up in Alberta. And for some reason, I just never stuck with the Flames or the Oilers. And I was a bit of a bandwagon, to be honest, until I was probably like 
2012. And then I just finally just stuck with Montreal and I, I don't even really know why. That's interesting. So the Bell Center to you would be, have you been to the Bell? Uh, you would have been to the Bell Center. Have you been? Yeah, I actually went on a, a school trip there. I think like grade eight. So. Nice. Uh, and Shane, uh, Mark Shifley. Uh, why is that? Um, so I think when I was about like 16, I kind of really got serious with hockey and I just try to find a role model, like a ready center man. Um, just for some reason, he, you know, he, he was kind of a guy who kind of came out of nowhere and worked his way up. And now he's obviously an unreal NHL player. So ever since then, he's been my favorite player. And if I do get the face off against him, I, that would be pretty cool, honestly. So do you uh, cheer for Winnipeg or you have a different team? Um, I'm a Penguin fan. So that's, uh, that's, uh, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, but yeah, I, I, when I was eight years old, when I started watching hockey, Crosby obviously was my guy. And, you know, ever since then I've been a Penguin fan. So, and they were really good then too. You know, they were back-to-back cups with Detroit. So I was, that, that's when I fell in love with the game really. So. That's fair. I mean, math won't talk to you anymore, but it's fair that you're a Sydney Crosby <laughs> yeah. fan. No yeah. hard feelings. It's all good. Yeah. <laughs> What building, I, I, uh, I guess JBD already answered it, but for Shane, you, what building would be the favorite one you're looking forward to playing in the most? Would it be in Pittsburgh or is there a different one for you? Um, probably Madison Square Garden, Sure, you know, for the Rangers. Um, me and my dad always used to go to Ranger games. I went to a few playoff games there. So I think that would be definitely one of those spots where I'd be like, wow, this is, you know, it's insane. And, but yeah, I think it'd be Madison Square Garden for sure. Yeah, I think most players, like I, I was having this conversation a couple of weeks ago with another guy. I think you guys both nailed the both. Well, I guess it's better with fans, but those two burns are the best to play in, in the league, like hands yeah. down. The fans are nuts. They're loud. And MSG just have, has tons of history. So good choice. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. 100%. Yeah. Shane, are you a better hockey player, golfer, or baseball player? <laughs> well, uh, hopefully hockey. Um <laughs> No, I, no, I think uh, I, I've been getting better at golf. Um, I heard you're a scratch golfer. No, 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 no. I'm like a four or five handicap. I would say. Oh, excuse, oh, sorry, sorry, my bad. No, no, I, it's, it, it, I've been getting much better as these summers went on. That's all I do in the summer. I just work out, skiing, and play golf. But um, I used to be better at baseball, but I just obviously now um, hockey. I hope I am better at than baseball and golf. <laughs> I would hope so. <laughs> You touched on you touched on working out. I just wanted to just segue that over to JBD for a sec. You got, you put on a ton of weight one summer, didn't you? Like you went because when you were on, I think on paper it was like one eighty, and then I double checked again and you're like one ninety five. Like what did you change in your diet, or did you just it was just one of those summers where you decided to hit the gas and get strong? Yeah, I, I guess college. I mean, um, <laughs> in juniors, like I obviously worked out, but um, not as not as much time with with all the scheduled games and. I think when I got to college, I just kind of just made a priority to, I knew if I had to get to that next level that, um, you know, I'd have to try to put some muscle on and, um, you know, I'm still trying to, I think my goal now is kind of just to get more explosive instead of putting muscle on and just gaining weight for no reason. So I think it kind of changes, um, you know, as your career goes on, I think I've just realized what I needed. Do they have you guys on like a meal plan there or anything like that? Cause I'm unfamiliar. I came through the junior ranks. It was a lot different, but I'm assuming you guys were all set up with that. Yeah, we, we get treated really well and um, like three three meals a day at the rink. And um, our chef oh, is wow. awesome. He, uh, he cooks some really healthy food. So we're definitely really lucky that way. I'm jealous. That, awesome. that building, I haven't seen in the, the inner workings, but that building is stunning that you guys play in. It, it's incredible. I think uh, when I went on my visit, I think like when I walked in there, it was um, I already love the coaching staff and, and everyone that I met there. But when, when you walk in that building, it's like, how can you say no? Yeah. It is nice. All right. So you're going to take to the ice. Are you looking forward to that first rookie lap that you have to make? Will you take the bucket off and make sure the hair is done? How is this going to play out? <laughs> um, for me, I will keep my helmet on um, <laughs> just in case anything crazy happens. But Actually, one of our uh, one of our teammates this year, Matt Kirsten, um, he played his first game two nights ago, I think, uh, for the yeah. Florida Panthers, and he was telling us that uh, he wore no bucky because he just couldn't find his bucket before Morris, so and he was scrambling, <laughs> so he just rushed out onto the ice. So I don't think it was uh, he meant to have no bucky, but yeah, I'm definitely going bucky on, no, no doubt. 
JPD. Yeah. Um, Come on, like, let the hair go. <laughs> man, my hair might get in my eyes if I do that. It's getting long. I haven't had a haircut in forever. So um, I guess it'll come down to game time. Like uh, Kier said he couldn't find his bucket before warm up. But um, I think my, my hair would be better than Penner's for sure. If Plus, I no chat. <laughs> <laughs> the vets sometimes uh, will force you guys to. You guys might get encouraged to just not wear yeah. it all together. And then. Ben, your your whole like theory you're on wearing it might just get thrown in the in the toilet. So we'll see. Yeah, I think uh, I think we'll just do it together. Whichever one we pick, we'll do it together. So, uh, Math, do you remember your first game, like that first my, lap? My my no, they I they never did that with me in Columbus. I don't know if they just didn't like me as a rookie, but <laughs> it never happened. And, what? and 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 for as far as like the no helmet goes, I started doing that in the American League as a rookie because we had that team full of meatheads and we just never wore helmets and, and, and then I got to Columbus and I think in year two or three I just started doing it and no one said anything so it became a habit but I was lucky never to get hit but I've seen some like some bad things yeah. happen to guys not wearing helmets so I would cut up you know when you're doing like the butterfly when you first get on the A everyone's firing pucks I would turn up like like halfway down towards the net because if you get close to that goal line and all those Aaron pucks are flying by it's scary so be careful yeah. if you do that <laughs> Jason Spezza I think got a couple stitches one time in Ottawa not yeah. wearing a bucket and then yeah, like Taylor, Taylor Taylor Hall, Hall in Columbus had a skate he fell down and a guy a guy stepped on his head oh, yeah. and he had like 30 staples down no. his forehead it was yeah. yeah so it can get really ugly yeah. Uh, Matthew, you know what we're going to do? We're going to rent an arena and I'm going to get you in your Columbus jersey and we're going to have a victory lap for you. Uh, okay. Wally, okay. Wally's doing this thing now every episode where he just chirps me. It's That's either my not, hair. I was just shirt. trying to help you. He just chirps me. Like, why am I even doing this? This has, <laughs> this has gone horribly wrong. I apologize. For <laughs> uh, okay. So have you... I mean, this is probably be more for Shane, but both of you, have you thought about that first NHL goal? And I don't mean any disrespect, JBD, but forwards tend to score a lot more than the blue liners. Um, honestly, that hasn't even crossed my mind. Um, I'm just worried about playing the right way for the coaching staff because those are the guys who are going to play you. So I just good answer, good answer. <laughs> yeah, especially as a that was, that was scripted. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> No, especially as a centerman, you just got to, you know, have the right details. I'm going to try to do my best on face-offs. And if I score, I score. That'd be a plus, but I'm just going to try to play the right way. So, JBD, you have a lot of uh, opportunity here. I'm, obviously, I don't th expect you to speak on that ex exactly, but do you have any idea who you might be playing with or what that might look like? I mean, I've a, me and Pinner obviously watch a lot of the games and, um, you know, here in quarantine especially. And, um I guess it's fun to watch the D-men and just kind of their tendencies and stuff. And, um, you know, I'd be happy to play with any of them. Um, I think for me, just, I think it'll be surreal just being in the NHL and, and uh, you know, getting to play with any of those guys would be an absolute pleasure. So I'm just looking forward to it. Another good, safe answer. I respect that. That's good. <laughs> I, I, I want to go back if I can quickly to uh, your draft interviews and um, something that I always come to find that's funny is the questions sometimes you guys get asked. Was there anything and JBD, I'll start with you. Anything that stands out from some strange questions you were asked in your interviews? Uh, I don't know if I actually remember like what what I was asked in my draft interview. I just remember being like so nervous. Well, not nervous, but just um, like you just got that adrenaline running through your running through your veins and um, just walking down the steps. I can still just remember, just don't fall, don't fall, don't fall. And that's, that's all I was saying to myself. Uh, fair enough. Shane, did you have any, like, in, in those pre-draft uh, interviews, anything that was strange? Um, I, I don't really remember too much. I think um, I have two stories. The first one was, I think, Montreal, actually. They had, like, one of their uh, – I don't know if it was assistant general manager, like a psychologist or whatever. And he, like, wanted me to throw, like, a pencil in, like, this box and see how confident I was in myself and, like, he, he asked me if I was going to make it on like a scale of one to 10 or something. It was something weird, but I remember something like that. And then when I got interviewed by Ottawa, it was my first one of, you know, the whole draft combine. And I was just so like, I was just kind of not freaking out, but I was pretty nervous and I wasn't too confident talking. And I was just stumbling upon my words. And um, 
once I left that uh, interview, I was like, dude, there's no chance these guys pick me. Like, <laughs> I, was like, I looked like an idiot in there. Um, and then they ended up picking me. So, which is pretty ironic, but yeah, those were my uh, two stories. So I guess Very that kind of, uh, that makes me think of a story actually, now that he says that, um, one of my interviews, I think it was with Detroit. They asked me about my summer workout schedule. Um, you know, I think, and I think that was the summer that I put on like 10 pounds of muscle or whatever it was. And, um, I was telling them that like, there's occasionally days where I'll do two workouts and, um, you know, if I'm feeling good and whatever it is, like a lift in the morning and more cardio or, um, plyometrics at night. And they're basically telling me that I didn't do that and kind of grilling me and just, just <laughs> let me have it. So I was like, I don't know, just, just trying to do my best, but I can just remember them just not believing anything I said. And it was kind of, tough. <laughs> <laughs> there was no fear that you were going to Detroit. I take it. Yeah, no. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, before we before we let you go, uh, we have one question that everybody loves to know the answer to, and that is if you're sitting around, perhaps in your hotel room right now, and you have to have a or you want a snack, what is your cheat snack? Not your like kale chips or your quinoa salad. What is it that you would grab if you could out of the, like the mini fridge or something? Uh, for me, I guess with Easter coming up, I guess uh, was it <laughs> yesterday, but. Um, mini eggs were around the house for about a week and those are, those are pretty deadly. So I might've dug into a few of those. Those are so good. Yep. Yeah. Full marks oh, on those. Man. Yeah. Um, for me, you have it, too many. Is that what it is? Shane? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm going between two. It's either Kit Kats. I love Kit Kats. They're unreal. Uh, Reese's pieces are very good or snowballs. I don't know if you guys ever had snowballs. I don't know if they have that here. It's like those pink coconut. Yes. Not, yeah okay, there you go. it's Wall like a little those. cake thing yeah 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 so those three probably i'll take three so wow okay yeah. you All could right, see fine. shane you could see shane stressing there like it was a combine <laughs> question eh? yeah. it's like oh i don't answer this it's, it's like a full sweat i'm like it's just a snack question <laughs> i was gonna say ice cream but that's too generic so i was gonna say, uh, yeah good man <laughs> fair enough uh gentlemen we've had a great time with you uh we enjoy uh, getting to know you a little bit better and we wish you all the best especially in your first games and in your first laps and we hope everything goes well and we look forward to a lot of games of you guys both uh, being ottawa senators boys thanks a lot thanks, thanks guys appreciate us having us yep. good luck boys thank you appreciate that is it. shane pinto and jacob bernard docker now of the ottawa senators uh, you're watching the wally Mathot show we'll be right back after this All right, welcome back to the Wally Mathod Show. Craig is joining us now. But before I get to you, Craig, just quickly, Matt, uh, we may owe uh, an apology or we missed a big question to Jacob Bernard Docker. You see, it, he wears number 48 for the Ottawa Senators in training camp. And if I remember correctly, in an interview with Mark Borowiecki, this is what you had to say about wearing number 48 in training camp for the Columbus Blue Jackets. Yeah, here's the clip. 74 is a good number though like for a training camp number it's it pretty solid like, yeah yeah like <laughs> when i got to columbus mine was 48 it yeah, like, like that's awful 48 might be the worst possible training <laughs> yeah. camp number you could get. And, and i still remember you know and and I, I it was such a big deal for me that it, i had such a brutal number on my back <laughs> okay i need to <laughs> Uh, what do I say? How did here? I forget this and not ask this question? Go yeah, on. the the hamster's turning now because I don't want to. You know what? I'm I'm gonna be I'm gonna stay true to my conviction here, and I'm gonna say that it's a terrible number. I don't wish it upon anybody. Uh, I don't regret my comments. I still <laughs> believe it's terrible. Um, it's just it's just not a sexy number. You know, when you look at it, you just think that screams I'm gonna get sent down next week. So. Uh, I don't have a lot of great or fond memories of 48. Do you own anything with the Columbus number 48? I don't have any training camp jerseys or hockey jerseys with 48 on them. I do, however, have hockey cards. I think it's, I think it's my rookie card or one of my rookie cards where I'm, I'm rocking number 48. They're somewhere in the basement in the furnace room. I've contemplated burning them, but they're still intact. Okay, well, I'm going to put you down for not having 48 and any time you pick a lot of 649 ticket. Um, <laughs> all right, Craig, uh, but I'm still, I'm so upset we didn't ask him this question. Anyway, maybe later we'll get him back on and I'll get to ask him once again. Um, Craig is now here with Trivial Trivia. How are you, my friend? 
Great, doing great. And you know what? Today we are giving away uh, another gong show sauce off kit. Maybe one of these days we can start giving away some signed Mark Mathot number 48 rookie cards. I think those might be in uh, hot demand. Gladly. Yeah, <laughs> but today we're, we're going to stay tried and true with a little gong show uh, sauce kit. So on Monday, uh, after interviewing our good friend Mark Borbietsky, we asked what his favorite snack is, one of our little fave questions on the show. And his answer was ice cream, which is a tr- tremendous answer. He's very plain Jane, so shout out to everyone who got that one correct, but particularly at Rick C565. So keep an eye on your DMs. We're going to reach out, and we are going to shoot you uh, one of these gong show sauce-off kits because they're awesome. Okay, uh, let's get to today's question. And we got another sweet little prize to give away here. Uh, it's a Chris Neal bobblehead in honor of him being on the show. Makes a ton of sense. Uh, so let's go back to uh, one of the interviews here and ask, uh, what is Shane Pinto's favorite number? So send us your answer on Twitter using the hashtag <laughs> Wally and Mathot. Uh, the contest closes on Saturday, April 10th at noon Eastern, and we will reveal the winner on Monday's show. It is not number 48. I can assure oh, you yeah. of that. <laughs> he's yeah. going gonna to hate us for this. We've been grilling <laughs> this now. He's like, he's anyway, whatever. We'll see how this works out for us. We may not ever get an interview with him again, but so be it. Uh, it'll be good. Uh, all right. And <laughs> before we go, uh, we just want to say, as we uh, finish up show number 10 here, that we appreciate all the viewer feedback that we're getting. We want you to continue to keep the comments coming. Uh, we make sure Craig reads them all. And then we will eventually uh, get back to more ask us anything or you want answers, I guess, as the segment's called. Uh, we appreciate you guys liking and subscribing to our YouTube channel and all the followers along our podcast podcast networks of Apple, Spotify, Google. So from all of us on this side of the camera, we just want to say thank you to everybody who's tuned in and made the first 10 episodes really special. We will continue that because we got a big show coming up for trade deadline day. It's a special. We've got side of the media who's a juggernaut on that side. And plus we got a guy who went through a couple of trade deadline deals and he's got some great stories to tell you. So don't go anywhere. We will see you on Monday and uh, have a great weekend, everybody. Take care.